Wildcats, listen up, high five a friend and sing along. Wildcats, listen up, high five a friend and sing along. We are all in this together. We are wow, you and me, united and free. We are all in this together. We are wow. Hey everyone, uh, welcome back to another Brain Smart Start. I'm Mr. Luke. Um, again, like you've been seeing, it's going to be Mr. Luke and Miss Stephanie alternating who's doing Brain Smart Start. So today you're seeing me, and uh, I hope you guys are doing well. And uh, so, following uh, this time, this is basically what's going to happen, okay? So, we're going to sing a wow song. Like we, uh, well, like we just did, right? And then we're gonna breathe together. Then we're gonna do some gentle stretching. Then we're gonna practice and learn a few words in uh, American Sign Language or ASL. Then we're gonna celebrate birthdays. Then we're gonna wish our community well. We're gonna go over our commitment for the week. We're gonna discuss a current event. And then we're gonna prepare for the rest of the day with us here on WOW Demand, okay? So let's go ahead and get right into our breathing, guys. Okay? So let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and do our star breathing. Okay? So you guys know how this goes. Uh, you extend your hand like this. You say stop, smile, take a deep breath, and relax. Okay? We're going to do that three times. And on the third time, as we always do, it's going to be silent. Okay? All right. So ready? On three. One, two, three. Stop. Smile. Take a deep breath. And relax. Stop. Smile. Take a deep breath. And relax. Okay, last time in silence. Good job, okay? I hope that makes you guys feel relaxed and uh, at peace, right? If you had any anxiety today or if you felt like you might have been, I don't know, nervous about something, I hope that this can help you to relax and to know that you are at peace today, okay? Okay, so now we're going to go right into our ASL for uh, today and this whole week, right? So we've been practicing different words. The first word is Space, okay? So space, like we've been practicing, is like this. Space. Space. Right? It's like you're catching all the stars in the sky. Space. Right? The next word is star, okay? So star is like this. Two fingers, like that, right? One's jetting past the other. Stars, like a shooting star. Star, star, okay? The next word is rocket ship, okay? So rocket ship is kind of like star, except you take your hand at like this, kind of open, then you're gonna turn it sideways, and then you're gonna take the letter R in sign language, right? And you're gonna put it next to it, and you're gonna do the same thing that you did with star, okay? You're gonna go like this, boom. Boom, like that, right? Like that, rocket ship, okay? That's like the R is the rocket ship and it's taking off, like you see in the shows and movies and, and videos and stuff, right? All right, so the next word and the last word is astronaut, okay? Astronaut is signed like rocket ship, but then we add a personifier, right? That personifier is like this. So in total, it looks like this, rocket ship person, right? Rocket ship person. That is how you sign astronaut. So astronaut, astronaut, okay? All right, good job, guys. All right, guys, so there are no birthdays today for any of you guys, but if you know anybody that has a birthday today, go ahead and wish them a happy birthday, tell them you love them, and let's go ahead and sing them a happy birthday song from WOW. Okay, guys? So ready? We're going to sing on three. 
One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Hey, happy birthday to you. Hey, happy birthday, dear everybody who has a birthday today. Happy birthday to you. Good job, guys. Again, I hope you guys all have a great birthday. Uh, if you're watching this um, with someone from the WOW Center and your, your birthday is today, I wish you well and I wish you have a great day today um, on your birthday, okay? All right, guys, so let's go ahead and move on to our wish wells for today. Uh, we have been wishing well our out of this world family, right? So whenever you say something is out of this world, that means that it's so great that it, it can't even be from Earth. It has to be from outer space, right? So that's what the expression is trying to say when you say out of this world. So if your family is out of this world, that just means that they're so great, right? That they're amazing. So let's go ahead and wish our family well, right? Whatever that looks like to you, whether it's your actual blood family that lives at home with you or your wow family or your friends, right? Whatever it is, let's go ahead and wish those people well. And then you can also wish well whoever you want, right? So in your head, you know, you know who you want to wish well. We're going to do it on three. Ready? One, two, three. We wish you well. And then we do in silver, throw it out, right? Again, we do that. So we throw out all the bad energy around us. And we toss it into uh, the... Uh, the air basically to make sure that it goes completely away all right so our commitment for this week is to make sure that you all of you i can't see you but i know you're there are going to the zoom meetings right so we have a daily zoom meeting at 12 30 with miss stephanie or again if anybody else uh, leads it it'll be at the same time but make sure that you are joining because we want to see you and we love you right so uh, we hope that you're there and, and uh, that you can see us and that we can see how you're doing and that we can have a little conversation, right? So just go ahead and join that Zoom meeting and uh, and we'll be there to see you, okay? So thumbs up if you're committed. I know I can't see you, but you can see me. So thumbs up if you are committed to that, right? To seeing the Zoom meetings every single day, um, unless you're sick or something, right? So make sure that you make it to the Zoom meeting, guys. All right, so our current events for uh this week have is basically it is space week right um so that being the case you guys saw that the intro has been different right miss stephanie put together a little cool intro for you guys and also um we have a special type of meditation coming up later okay which i will introduce in a sec but for now just know that it is space week so uh during this week you know we're learning everything about space and we're maybe learning things we've never heard before, right? And that's always great because you get to share that information with your friends and with your families, right? Um, it's always good to know more things, right? It's better to know more than less. So let's just continue to learn, right? Um, listen up and, and make sure you pay attention, right? When we're teaching you these things because you never know when these things are going to come in handy for you in the future, okay? Also, uh, it is uh, like I had just said previously, very very important that you um that you go to these zoom calls right again the zoom call that's at 12 30 with miss stephanie or whoever else wants to lead it uh just make sure that you are attending that and that uh, we can see all of your faces right okay so like uh i said before we have the special meditation uh that has to do with star wars right so star wars meditation is a little different uh, but it is very la relaxing, and uh, I hope that you can uh, really feel at peace and um, and feel zen, as they say, right? Which just means tranquility and calmness in your person, right? So um, we're going to try and uh, witness what the Force uh, can do and what the power of the Force can bring to our souls, at least um, as per the Star Wars meditation, okay guys? So on three, I'm gonna transport you into uh, the world of the Force and you are going to meditate like a true Jedi, okay? So on three, you will be transported there magically. All right, one, two, three.
sit down and get comfortable, just like true Jedi do. They need to meditate and focus to be powerful and to defend the weaker people. Meditating is for warriors too. First, we're going to practice some breathing. Relax your body and relax your mind. We are about to connect both. Take a deep breath in through your nose and breathe out slowly out of your mouth. Breathe in through your nose. Hold it. And breathe out slowly from your mouth. Take a deep breath in through your nose and a slow, deep breath out. Breathe in and breathe out. Well done. Now that your body and mind are completely connected in peace, it's time to take the elevator up to the palace of Naboo. You get on the elevator and wait for it to get to the 10th floor. You get past the first floor and feel very relaxed. The second floor makes you feel a cool breeze that relaxes you even more. You keep going up. As the third and fourth floors pass, you are safer and more connected to your mind. When you go through the fifth and sixth floors, a wave of blissful tranquility passes through your entire body. Seven, eight, you are sliding deeper and deeper into a state of true relaxation. You feel wonderful. You feel peace. You feel calm. Nine, 10, you are feeling 100% safe. You feel awesome and you're ready to enter the universe of Star Wars. Open your mind. You are about to enter a galactic journey. If you take a look around, you'll see a closed space full of cables, switches, levers, and intermittent lights. In the corner of the room you are in, you see Chewbacca and C-3PO playing a table game. It's not familiar to you. They are playing some kind of galactic chess, but the chess pieces look like very strange creatures. Some of them are bigger than others, and you realize that they are holograms that the two players never touch. When a bigger piece meets a smaller one, the smaller one is eaten or destroyed, just like they were not holograms. You don't understand completely how it works, but you can see that C-3PO is clearly beating Chewie. But when he is about to win the game, Chewie starts to get very nervous, like he does not want to lose. So C-3PO pretends that he loses and lets Chewie win. After this happens, you hear a voice from a different room. Chewbacca sometimes pulls arms out of droid sockets when he loses, so they let him win. Whose voice is this? You take a few steps and manage to see where the voice comes from. There's someone piloting the place. Wait, it's Han Solo. So you are in his spaceship, the Millennium Falcon. Solo turns his head towards you and winks at you smiling without saying a word. You walk to a large room It's completely empty and clean. The walls are white and the floor is gray. The only object in the whole room is a metal ball placed right in the middle of the room. 
you get to the ball and try to grab it with your right hand. But when you're about to touch it, Obi-Wan Kenobi appears and tells you, you should not grab it using your body, but you will move it using your mind, which is your true strength. Master Obi-Wan shows you how to do it. Without moving a single muscle, he takes the ball up in the air where it remains for five seconds. Obi-Wan wants you to use this force. He tells you to focus and breathe deeply. You must be very, very calm to use the force. You concentrate. You try super hard to move the metal ball. You even run out of breath. But the ball does not move a bit. Obi-Wan stares at you and you can't understand why you cannot find your force and move the ball. You are thinking about giving up, but somehow Obi-Wan knows it and tells you, the force is not something you have to find all you have to do is attract it to you. Always keep in mind why you want that force. Remind yourself why you are doing this effort, the reason you train, the reason you concentrate. In order to make force come to you, you need to find your passion. If your passion is honest and makes other people happier, you will be on the light side of the force. Now, what is your passion? You want to use the force. You want to be strong, but why? I promise you that you will find an answer. And when you hold that passion and remind it to you constantly, you will be capable of moving the ball. Remember, young Padawan, there is no ignorance. There is knowledge. There is no sadness. There is love. There is no chaos. There is harmony. May the force be with you. You get out of the large room. You feel super happy. You have learned a very important lesson. Finding a passion is what will make you stronger. You see Princess Leah and ask her about what Kenobi told you. She talks to you in a very relaxed tone. And every word she says makes you more and more relaxed. You see Princess Leia and ask her about what Kenobi told you. She talks to you in a very relaxed tone, and every word she says makes you more and more relaxed. Don't worry too much about finding your passion, kid. Just do what you enjoy doing. Live your life, and someday you'll find it. Since I was a little girl, I loved helping people to avoid harm at all costs. So when I grew up, I found that my goal in life is to assure peace in the galaxy. That is what motivates me to fight against Lord Sidious and the Empire. I advise you not to rush. You will find it. But don't get obsessed, kid. Some people get lost in life looking for their passion. They forget that you must enjoy life as well having fun and doing things you like. In my opinion, not everything is about fighting and being powerful. Listening to Leah makes you happy. She always has something helpful to say. You walk past her after saying goodbye and you see Obi-Wan coming to you. He stops in front of you and says, hello again, young Padawan. In order to keep healthy and ready for missions, we follow a strict workout routine. 
Those Jedi who don't work out are always below Jedi who train their body every day. In addition to improving our bodies, we meditate and we read lots of books to stimulate our minds and of course, to learn new things. People don't usually know it, but being a Jedi takes a lot of effort and time. Well, I should say that being a great Jedi takes a lot of effort and time. If you are still interested in becoming a Jedi, next time you come over here, we will learn how to use the lightsaber to both attack and defend yourself. It's time you leave now. We are going to an extremely dangerous mission and you're not ready yet. Who knows? If you train and come to the Millennium Falcon often, you might be the leader of our next mission. You say goodbye to Obi-Wan and walk to the command center where Han Solo is still piloting the spaceship. You sit next to him. It's time to leave the Falcon and go back home for a while. Hello, kid. Are you ready to jump to light speed? Whenever you want to come back, you know what to do. You have to do it, but you don't want to leave the Millennium Falcon. You have met a lot of new and interesting people there. So Han Solo gives you a microchip. If you ever want to come back here with us, you just have to close your eyes, focus, and you'll be back here with us. The countdown for speed light jump begins. Five, you hear the sound of the engine speeding up. Four, you remember what Obi-Wan told you while the sound becomes louder and louder. Three, find your passion and you will be strong. Two, find your passion and the force will come to you. One, you and the Millennium Falcon disappear in the depths of the galaxy. Now it's time to open your eyes. You have just lived a true adventure and made new friends. Will you ever come back to this universe and try to move the metal ball? Until then, may the force be with you. Skywalker and Han Solo rescued the princess, destroyed the Death Star, but their story didn't end there. This is Allie Townsend for Time, and in honor of the 30th anniversary of The Empire Strikes Back, we went in search of a new way to continue the legacy of Star Wars. Luckily, the hilarious Matthew Lekowitz created a way to meld modern fitness trends with classic Jedi training. I knew I had to take a class. <laughs> Perfect! And so the idea was, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you do a, a, a warrior pose, you know, or a crow pose. You know, I don't know how, to, how a crow is supposed to feel, what's a warrior supposed to feel. However, you give, me, you give me a TIE fighter pose, you know, you give me a Jedi pose. Now those are things that have meaning to me, they have resonance, and I feel like I can, I can really uh, uh, get into those uh, uh, more, more than I would, you know, more traditional yoga. Uh, you know, we're really going to, we're going to connect to the force, we're going to get the midichlorian flowing, um, and have a good time. Great, let's do it. In traditional yoga, this would be called table pose. So right. hands uh, under the shoulders and knees underneath the hips. Um, uh, however, uh, in Star Wars yoga, um, you know, what's so inspirational about uh, uh, being a table? You know, what, what, what can we find from that? However, what if you channeled the Adat walker? This, of course, uh, from uh, the system of Hoth. So uh, here I want you to take your, uh, take your left hand back a couple inches, take your right hand forward a couple like you're walking, turn your head and you look like this. Excellent. Good. 
If you go into the core and you and you fire up the core just like Luke fired up the um, the core by throwing in the the grenade into the the belly of the AT-AT, uh, you 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 lift your your uh, belly up. Uh, in this pose here, and you bring yourself down because you were going into collapsed at at just like Luke down in here, and you put your, your, your face on the ground like this, and your arms by your sides, if you can. This one, there you are, perfect. So, so crouch into a ball here, TIE Fighter, excellent. And now, um, I want you to uh, uh, lift your elbows, we need to make the wings, excellent. So this would be beginning TIE Fighter here, and, and here again, uh, a lot of core, you know, your wings are here just to really help you navigate in the vacuum of space. Uh, your core is what does all the work in this pose. You extend your arms down next to you like this, and this is, this is the, the first level of the pose. It's a good, good place to be. Good place to be is, is in this pose here. Um, advanced, however, you actually want to remember this. Sometimes R2D2 is sitting on, on his cylinder and his, his arms, but then when he has to move, he of course raises himself up like this. Very hard pose. And then, but then uh, really advanced, you have to you have to move like him. Go back and forth. I think the force is failing me. Tourists in New York's Central Park couldn't keep their eyes off of us, so Matthew invited them to join along. We met yoga fit instructor Katie Harden, who volunteered and quickly caught on to the new brand of yoga. Push back into downward facing Wookiee, uh, which is like downward facing dog, except you raise one hand, uh, and in very advanced postures, you make the Chewbacca sound. <laughs> Perfect! <laughs> We, we move into revolved speeder bike. So uh, mirroring me, uh, take your left uh, elbow to your right knee and hold your blaster out as if you were trying to knock a, um, uh, a stormtrooper off of his speeder bike. And we're gonna hold for one parsec, two parsec, the burn, feel the burn in your legs. That's the midichlorian just moving around. We wanna bring it down uh, and we want to uh, feel the, f the force uh, flowing between you, between me, uh, the tree, the rock, everything. Um, and to do that, we, we lie down on our backs. Uh, so, so lie down on your backs here. And um, in, uh, in yoga, there's a pose called, called corpse pose. Well, you know, what a, you know, how inspirational is that? So what we do is we don't go into, we don't go into death. We don't go into corpse. Instead, like, like Han Solo at the end of Empire Strikes Back, we go into carbonite pose. So if you remember, Han Solo is frozen in carbonite. His hands are, are, are held out, resisting. His eyes are closed. His head is back. And we rest like that for two years while they make Return of the Jedi. And welcome back, everybody. I hope that you feel relaxed and uh, well, ready to go throughout the rest of your day and ready to learn more things, right? So uh, after this, after Brain Smart Start, you guys are gonna have all your classes, right? But I'm gonna tell you which classes you have coming up next, okay? So after this, after Brain Smart Start, you're gonna have STEM. Then after STEM, you're gonna have social services with a guest appearance, which I will not spoil for you until you see it, so you can be very surprised and happy when you do, okay? All right, uh, after that, you're gonna have art. Uh, then you're gonna have music, right? After that, you're gonna have lunchtime and again, the Zoom meeting with Miss Stephanie. Don't forget about the Zoom meeting. All right, uh, so after that, uh, you guys are gonna go to life and work skills. Then uh, followed by that, you're gonna have CBE. And then lastly, like always, you're gonna have your rights and uh, your rights review and you also your review for tomorrow's schedule, okay guys? So with that being said, I hope you guys uh, have enjoyed this Brain Smart Star session and uh, that you can go throughout your day uh, remembering what we've been learning and also that you can learn more things in the rest of your classes today with all of your teachers, okay? So with that being said, guys, I hope you're doing well and I hope you have an amazing day. Peace out!
guys, my name is Carlos and it's really fun play with time. Obviously, the time continuum has been disrupted, creating this new temporal event sequence resulting in this alternate reality. English, Doc. Here, here, here. Let me, let me illustrate. Imagine that this line represents time. Here's the present, 1985, the future and the past. Prior to this point in time, somewhere in the past, the timeline skewed into this tangent, creating an alternate 1985. Alternate to you, me, and Einstein, but reality for everyone else. Recognize this? It's the bag the sports book came in. I know, because the receipt was still inside. I found them in the time machine. Along with this. What? I didn't understand. Time skills. Hello guys and welcome back to another STEM class. Today we're gonna continue the uh, skills week and well the first two days we learn about community. The next two days we're gonna learn about time, how to read it and of course we'll you know be ready if somebody asks you what time is it. But first we're gonna learn a little bit of the history behind time and well all methods that people used to use to tell the time as well. But what is this? Well, we all know that this is a, a clock. But how is that this machine can tell us what time of the day is it? Well, humanity has not always had clocks. So how did they do um, in old time to tell the time? Can I know what time is it even if I don't have one of these near? Well, yeah, there is an answer for all these questions and that is exactly what are we going to learn today. So pay attention. Clocks are a relatively modern invention. Of course, what we know today as a clock, this, well, this was invented in the 1600s, more than 400 years ago. But the story of uh, timekeeping devices is much older than that. Yes, anything that can tell the time is actually known as a timekeeping device. People has always had the need to know what time it is. It helped us uh, to have order, well, during the day. For example, not to take breakfast at night or not to go to sleep at 10 a.m. in the morning. Well, we do that sometimes, but that's not the point. Also help us to know what time should I be at school? Yes, time help us to keep our activities in order and to be more productive. That is why humanity has searches for a way to tell time using the most random devices. But they work actually very well. Pay attention to this video so we can know more about these devices during the history. There was a time where we only used the changing seasons to see how far we'd come. We'd look up and observe patterns in the moon and stars to see where to run. Capturing the sun's shadow with sticks, poles and obelisks. And the sundial could track its movements well, without a hitch. Then the hourglass came, converting sand into primitive ticks and tocks. The same was done with drops inside the water clock. Fire burns the wax down, next to spaced markings until it halts. Or for a scented alternative, an incense-filled ball dropper. Susong's mechanical cosmic engine accurately followed planets and stars. As did Al Jazeera's most elegant and functional castle clock. It wasn't long before we saw the first spring-driven pocket watches, carried around with no need for the sun. Soon Galileo saw that a pendulum takes the same amount of time to complete each swing, becoming a precise timekeeper for years to come. 
The wristwatch built its name in World War I when soldiers found pocket watches to be impractical. Its first electronic movements came with the quartz oscillator, a crystal that proved to be quite compatible. From analog to digital, the hands became LED numbers on a screen. And now we have atomic clocks, the most accurate timekeeper known to be seen. What of the future? The clock of the long now aims to keep time for 10,000 years. Who knows about in between? But with all the gadgets and gizmos you can manage your time with in so many ways, you can still take a look outside and know it's a new day. Knowing how to say the time is one of the most important skills that we should know. Everything in our day-to-day -day is actually determined by the time. What time should I eat? Or what time do I have to take my medicine? Or what time is my appointment with my doctor? Everything is related with time. Of course, these and many other things. In order to know the time, there are some basic knowledge that we must know. The main thing is to know how the day is divided in terms of time. For example, a day has 24 hours. A day on Earth it's divided in 24 equal hours. Every hour, it's divided in 60 minutes each. And every minute, it's divided in 60 seconds each. Just like this. You can see it right here. One day, it's equal to 24 hours. One hour, it's equal to 60 minutes. In one minute, it's equal to 60 seconds each. You can see this example. And of course, you can copy if you want. When we read the time, what we actually say is the hour and minute of the day in which we are. Uh, so for example, please check this clock that I'm going to just put here and tell me what time is it. So the clock look just like this one. So as you can see, the big arrow is pointing to the 12th and the small one is pointing to the number two. That means that is two o'clock. Why? Well, that is something that we're gonna be learning in our next class. Why the big one show the minutes and, uh, and why and how the, the short one show the hours. That will be on our next class. And we're actually going to do some exercises. So be ready. For now, I'm going to leave this right here. And I'll put a clip or a video uh, of how to do your own sundial. If you put attention to the video before, we learned that uh, during the history, a lot of different devices were used to tell the time. And one of the most famous ones, and actually some people still use it, is the sundial that use the light of the sun to tell what time is it during the day. You want to make your own? Well, I'll explain you how to do it. So pay attention to the video that I have. And after that video, there's some questions for you to answer. It was amazing to be with you. I wish you well, guys. I'll see you next class with more time skills. Bye. Hello, guys, and welcome back to another project with Carlos. Today, uh, because we're learning about time, we're going to build our own uh, sundial, which was a type of clock that people used to use a long time ago to read the time using the sun. And we're going to be using very easy materials that we can all find in our houses. Again, I always tell you, please ask for help. In this case, we're going to be using some scissors as well. So ask for help and also for permission for you to get these materials. It's very simple. So let me tell you, we're gonna use a marker. You can use also a pencil or a pen, that's fine. We're gonna be using a, per, a paper plate, like this, like any regular paper plate that you can find in your house. And we're gonna, we need some scissors. We need as well some, uh, I'm sorry, a ruler. And in this particular case, 
Um, I'll be using these that I just find in my house. This is a, is it called a spring bull compass? It's fine. If you don't have one of these, I know it sounds complicated. Don't worry. You can do it with your hands. I'm going to be using this one just for the video, but I'll explain you how to do it just with your hands. So the first thing that we need to do is that um, of our plate that pretty much they all look like a circle. We need to find the center. How do we do that? Well, we're going to fold it. We're going to fold one of the sides first like this and make sure that you uh, this is very well, just like this. Now you're going to fold it to the other side. And you're going to do the same. You're going to fold it very well, just like this. When you open it, you're going to have a cross. So the point where the cross, where the two lines cross each other, that's our center. So we're going to use our marker and we're going to highlight it before we forget. There you go. That's our center. So the first thing that we need to do is that we have to make a line across the uh, middle of the plate. We're going to use our uh, center as a point of reference. We're going to take the, the ruler, we're going to put it like here just like this, and we're going to make a line. Perfect. Just like that, it's fine. You don't have to reach the, the edge or the all, the all the way to the other side. Just like this is fine. And then we're going to make the a line, but in the opposite way. This one is going like um, horizontal. We're going to do it vertical. But instead of doing it in both sizes, we're going to do it from the center going down, just like this. Like that. And it's going to look like a letter T. You see it? Perfect. What's next? Okay. Well, we are going to need to join these two points with a semicircle. How do we do it? Well, that's why we have these uh, string bow compass. We're going to take it and we're going to place it in the center. Just like that. We're going to open it as much as we need it. And we're going to roll it like this. As you can see, it draws a semicircle. As I said, you don't have to uh, use one of these if you don't have it. Don't worry about it. And what you can do is just take your marker and do it with your hands. Like if you're drawing a circle. It's going to look like this, like a mouth that is laughing. <laughs> you see it? Perfect. This is what we need. What's next? Well, now we need numbers to read the time, right? So our numbers are going to go from six, this, this side, all the way to the other side. And the 12 is going to be here in the bottom. So that's what going to be our point of reference with numbers. We're going to put a 12 right here. Okay. So next, if you put the, the uh, plate in front of you like this, like this, the right side is going to be the AM. So we're going to write it down. AM. And the other side is going to be PM. What does this mean? AM means morning and PM means afternoon and night. So the next step is to divide each side in five. So we need five different lines that are, that are going to be our hours. How do we do that? Well, let me explain you. I'll be right back. OK, guys, as I said, we have to divide each side in uh, five lines from the center to a point that we're going to create. So this is a dot that we have to actually draw here. Here, 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 and here. You can see it there. We have to do the same on the other side. So we're going to take a ruler. 
and we're just gonna make the lines as um, like the same as this side, like this. I have one. Two. Three. Four. And finally, right here. Five. Okay, perfect. It's done. We have five lines to one side and five lines the other side. As I said before, the number 12 is going to be our reference for the numbers. So in the AM side, this one is going to be six, like this. And we're going to keep going until 12. So it's going to be six, seven. Each line is going to be a number. Okay, each line is going to be a number. Eight, nine, 10, 11, like that. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So what comes after twelve at afternoon? Well, the number one. So again, in this side, each line is gonna be one number. So it's twelve, one, two, three, four, five, six, until we reach six once again. So it's gonna be a.m. six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12 p.m. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So we have our 12 hours here. Now we finish with our marker. We need a straw. Actually, I don't need the whole straw. I just need a piece. So I'm just going to cut it here. And this is the piece that I need. I'm going to take some tape. And let me show you. I'm gonna put it right here like this and I'm gonna attach the straw to our center okay as center as possible choose like that I just got this just like that perfect now I need it very straight so I'm just going to use some more tape to touch the next day on the other side. So this side. Perfect. There you go. So now our sundial is, uh, I mean, our straw is attached to our sundial. And it's going to look just like this. But how does it work? How does this work? Well, let me just turn this light off because we're not, we're not going to need it. And I'm going to use this flashlight as the sun. When you place your sundial outside, the sun is going to create, uh, when the sun hit the straw or the stick that you're using, well, that is going to create a shadow. If it's the afternoon, the sun is going to come from this side. So when the shadow reach the number six, what time do you think it is? 6 a.m. in the morning. So the sun is gonna keep going and keep going and keep going um, through the day as the day, you know, like keep going. For example, here, the shadow is on the number nine. That means that it's 9 a.m. It's gonna keep going and keep going and keep going. When the sun is on the top of the sky, the shadow is gonna be at 12. That means that it's 12 at noon. It's gonna keep going and going. Now it's afternoon. For example, here, it reached the three. So that means that it's 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And so on and so on. So will you ask me why we only have from six in the morning to six in the afternoon? Well, usually after six in the afternoon, there is no more sun. It's already night. So this doesn't work at nine because we don't have a sun. That's why you can see only from the uh, from the morning to the afternoon, and uh, well, like um, because of the rest of the of the plate is actually white, you can decorate it the way that you want. Okay, you can take some colors or markers and you know like make some color around it, but make sure that the this side, like the, all this bottom, 
uh, the bottom of the plate is uh, you keep it white because it's gonna make easier for you to read the time. Again, uh, guys, as I, as I always say, if you're gonna use things like the scissor, ask for help. And for you to uh, get materials, also ask for, uh, for help and ask for permission. Don't take it just because, okay? Amazing, guys, this is our exercise, our, our project for today. I hope you enjoy it. As I said, this is a using materials that we all have in our houses. I hope you like it. I'll see you next time. Bye. Hey everybody, it's Reggie here again, a uh, social worker here at the WOW Center. I uh, wanted to say hello to all of our WOW family who are out there viewing this video right now. Um, I hope all of you continue to do well and that you are doing your best to remain at home and that when you do go out, you are practicing all the safety precautions like wearing a mask and trying to keep at least six feet away from other people that you are in contact with. I hope this video does help you um, as well to pass a little bit of time. And I want to encourage all of you once again that we will get past this and that this will be over with soon and that we will all be able to see each other once again face to face here at the WOW Center. In the meantime, um, I thought it would be a good topic to talk about getting outside 
I know there has been some mention about this in the other videos as well, and I just wanted to repeat that once again. Um, you know, I know everybody has been taking this stay at home order as, you know, having to stay inside your house. Um, but I'm hoping many of you have available to you, um, you know, whether you're living in an apartment building, uh, supported living in a house, um, in a townhouse, wherever it may be, that you do take the opportunity to get outside and just to get some fresh air uh, to be able to hear, you know, birds singing, uh, to see some of nature and maybe have a new appreciation for it. Um, you know, be able to maybe, if you're able to plant something, uh, plant a flower or something else that you can kind of um, take care of and that will help take your mind off of things. For those of you who have pets, of course, you know, you have an automatic kind of way to get out of the house and take your pet outside. Uh, but whether it's walking around your neighborhood or, you know, stepping out into a yard, uh, stepping out onto the front patio, uh, whatever it may be, I just want to put an emphasis on, you know, as safely as you can uh, to get out of the house. You know, there are many health benefits to that as well, um, as well as getting some sunlight and things like that that will be really helpful uh, for you as well. But to just kind of, you know, get outside of those uh, four walls that you may have at home and uh, just get a new kind of view and perspective on things on the outside of your house. Um, so having said that, uh, just like this video is being brought to you by technology, I know many of you have technology available to you as well. And um, so there are some pretty cool things um, that you can do as far as taking what are called virtual tours, which are um, kind of a way to enjoy places that maybe you haven't been before, maybe you have been before, but instead of being able to go to those places, as you know, many of those places are closed, you can do it on your computer. Um, so I thought that um, during today's video, I could share with you some of those resources that are available on the internet. I will be using my cell phone, so the picture may be a little bit small, and that's just because, uh, you know, I'm using my computer for this, and I think it would actually show better on my phone than it would uh, you know, if I tried to stand in front of another computer and stuff like that. Uh, so what I did was I kind of uh, broke it down into some local things here in Miami uh, that are available as virtual tour. And some of these you may have been to, or maybe, you know, after taking this virtual tour, you may think, hey, you know, once this virus thing settles down and, and we're able to go out and, and stuff like that as we please, then maybe you can ask your caregiver ask your parents, ask your companion to take you to one of these places and be able to enjoy it in person. Uh, but in the meantime, okay, I'm gonna start with some places right here, like I mentioned, in Miami. Um, and then I'm gonna move to some of the national parks here in the United States and then some places in other countries. Um, you know, of course, the national parks and, and stuff like that that I'm gonna show and, uh, you know, Obviously, getting out of the country as well may be challenging to many of you. I know it would be very challenging to me as well, um, but at least these are some additional things that you can look at and enjoy from a distance since we're having to do that anyway. And who knows, maybe some of you might see something on here and it might be possible for you to go to those places. So uh, like I mentioned, the first place I wanted to start with is here in Miami. And so the website that we are visiting is Miami on the cheap. Um, so you could just type that into, you know, use Google. Uh, you could type that into there and find this page. And then on here, there are several places, as it meant mentions, you know, Miami arts, venues, attractions, um, events go virtual. So, you know, of course, perfect timing in response to this. And so if you're able to find this page, I just want to kind of scroll through it um, with you. When you get towards the bottom of it, it starts showing you some places that might be a little bit hard to see for you there at home. Uh, but it shows you some places that you can visit. Uh, and then one of the ones that I wanted to go to, because this was something that hasn't been open for too long, the Frost Science Museum. And it was a place that I definitely had on my list that I wanted to take with my family. 
but unfortunately we didn't get to go there before all of this started. So this is the um, place on this list of places that I'm going to choose to go because, hey, I want to check that out, see what's available to me, and then hopefully, um, you know, go there as soon as all this is done. So what you can do is just click on it. And again, I'm clicking on the Frost Science Museum, and then it will take you there. You see Frost Science at home, explore the museum di digitally. Okay, so you scroll down the page, it kind of, you know, shows you the picture. It has a little video, and then right underneath the video, if you click here, it will open up something else for you. And again, on your computer or, or uh, on your phone or your tablet as well. Okay, and it's going to start this little video here. And then what you can do down here in the corner, you can tell it to go full screen. And now we are in our virtual tour. It will give you instructions on how to move around. And we're at our virtual tour of the Frost Museum. So you see that there, that's pretty cool. And, um, you know, using your phone and stuff, it's doing it on its own for right now. But at any time, if you click on the screen, uh, you can actually take control of it yourself. Okay, and start viewing, you know, you can view up and down, which is to me just absolutely amazing. Okay, so here we have a wall. And um, on this wall, you can literally read all the people who have contributed. Um, even the smallest little ones here, people's names and stuff that have given to the Frost Science Museum. And you can scroll on your own, up and down, left, right. Uh, you can even, if you want to, look down at the sidewalk. Like, this thing is just amazing. And then when you're ready to move forward, you see that little arrow there? You can move forward, continue to move forward, um, view things. And then once you get to the end of somewhere which I did earlier. So right now we're out in the garden, which, hey, getting some of that outside. There you can scroll around, you know, go in whatever directions you want to. So I wanna to continue to go inside of the building here. Um, there's the admission. And now we're coming up on the elevators. Okay, and then you reach a certain point and then it will take you to the next place available in the museum, which is the Vista. So you can go there and then, you know, you're in a whole new different place of the museum. So this I just found just absolutely amazing. Um, just, you know, unbelievable what uh, technology is able to, to do. And so, you know, we can go over in this direction and just explore. And it's just absolutely amazing to me. You can see the displays or their stingrays. You can go look over and they even captured, you know, some of the people that happen to be there on this particular day. Um, so again, just something to be able to explore. You could, you know, view some displays and things like that here. And it's just, you know, like I said, awesome, fully interactive, three, three dimensional. Oh, look at this step inside. Let's step inside. Okay, takes us through like we were there ourselves. Oh, and so next section is the dive. So again, just taking you through here, I'm discovering some of these places on my own for the first time. So we could step inside this area. Oh, look at that. Look here, and they have the pictures of different scientists with different things here. And uh, you can even click, look at this. Let's see what this does. So this would be a board that would be interactive if you were at the museum itself. So just uh, pretty, just awesome stuff here. And um, yeah, so, and here we go. We can look at the aquarium, you know? So that's just a little preview of the Frost Museum here. and. Then you could go to shrink the screen um, for it to get smaller. <clears throat> okay, and then you can even go back out. All right, so 
again. So I mentioned this is one of the places here available in Miami. So the next place I want to go is kind of, say you want to get outside of Miami, you know? Why, why not, right? So we can go to the next page that I found. Um, this is through msn.com, okay, Travel and Leisure. And the title of the article is Need to Get Outside. All right, so you could go to msn.com once again, <clears throat> type in Need to Get Outside. This article should pull up uh, for five national parks. So these are parks that are within the United States, um, you know, that are featured in this article. All right, so we'll go ahead and scroll down. And these are for people as well who might like to get outdoors. You know, the first place we did was in a museum, which was kind of inside and stuff. But these are ac actual national parks that can get you on the outside and you can just check out some cool things there. So again, you would click on um, show more, you know. And so right here, the first one is available is the the Kanai, the Kanai Fords National Park in Alaska. And I checked this one out myself because this one was just like, wow, okay? So this one says for the best thing to um, put in headphones, I don't have any, but um, when you first go, listen to that. 1,000 miles north of the continental United States lies a land where the ice age still lingers. Look at that, pretty amazing, huh? So it's just the intro Come video. Come park ranger Fiona North and explore the mountains, glaciers, and lagoons of Kenai Fjords National Park. All right, so it gives you a virtual tour guide. This place is wild in the true as well. sense of the word. Hmm. It's inaccessible in the winter, and there are only a few trails in the entire park. Right. So you get a kind of a little introduction. Connections here are so obvious between the mountains and the ocean, the glaciers and the animals. Everything just works the way nature intended. What excites me so much about Kenai Fjords is seeing things I've never seen before. I moved here from New York City, and once I saw what it was like, I didn't want to leave. Okay, so that's the introduction. Look down. You're standing above a crevasse on Exit Glacier. So check this out. Just have to look Glacier down, right? Is one of the most visited parts of the park, but very few people get to come up here and walk out onto the ice or venture right. into one of the So you crevasse. scroll around on your phone. Climb down and join me. And look at this. As you rotate your phone, actually, besides using your finger, your phone reacts to that motion. So look at this. I can view down, like she said, view up, view all around where the people are. I know it's kind of hard to see that, but different aspects of the mountain and stuff. And then when you're ready, she said to climb on in, right? So you click on her. We're in a crevasse. Um, and so she's talking. So look, you tilt so that down. But the view down, view up. up. Look at that. A week from now, so it actually this puts you inside with the lady. The has over so the that's the top view. All right, and you can again use your finger as well on this one. All right, so there she is, like you were there with her, like you had actually climbed down into the crevice and you're there. All right, so you see your guide there climbing. All right, again, rotate around and look, it even shows you like you're on the rope, like you're attached to the rope. Like this is just, to me, just awesome. Look at that. All right, and then you can rotate back around the finder and then it gives you another option to go watch a glacier map. Exit Glacier when I first arrived at the park. The glacier has retreated 46 feet per year on average, but in the past few years that has spiked dramatically. It's been melting about 150 feet per year. At this rate, where will the ice be 10 years from now? How long before it's not even here at all? Okay, look around this glacier, and then what you can do is you click 
on the year all right and then it will show you when you rotate around it shows the change 7 2009 all right look at that look at how low it is let's see if I can get that back for you again okay and you click over again even lower and then now almost gone so just I said just awesome stuff um, through this one and just uh, yeah there's four more on there that you can check out this is just one of one of four and as you can see it's just amazing so that that was a Ford and then you could go to Hawaii volcanoes uh, which is another just absolutely awesome one they also have um, Carlsbad Cavern National Park in New Mexico, Bryce Canyon National Park in, in, in Utah, and one of the ones here, I don't know if you can see that, but Dry Tap Tortugas National Park in Florida. All right, so how cool is that, huh? To be featured in one of the um, type five places that they want you to go and check out. So uh, again, just another resource for, like I said, parks here still. In the United States, of course, you would have to leave the state, except for maybe the dry, dry Tortugas, you know, you could travel there since that's local here in Florida. Um, but just, you know, I'm still just amazed by that uh, Alaska tour, like just absolutely awesome tour guide, um, the whole entire deal. And again, you could do this from from home. All right. So the last thing I mentioned was for international all right so that is leaving the united states and going um to a whole nother country and for that one uh this resource is available through the guardian.com and then it's backslash travel i don't know if you can see that up there but again the guardian.com back, back backslash travel Okay, and this is 10 virtual tours of the world's most famous landmarks, okay? So again, this expands your world to maybe places you've never been, never imagined to go. Um, but again, you know, thanks to technology, which many of us are relying heavily on, um, these days we can go explore these places, all right? So we have Machu Picchu, Peru, Christ the Redeemer in Rio de Janeiro, Pyramids of Giza. So I think I'm going to check out the pyramids. Always been curious about that. So we'll click right there on virtual tour and Google Maps will take us right there. All right. The last standing wonder of the ancient world. Okay. So it gives you some history. Um, Great pyramids, you know, how many years ago it was built, the number of blocks that were used, um, how long it took to build it. All right, and then here it has different sites. So with our finger, we can click on there and it kind of pops up a picture. Uh, Google Maps will take you there, okay? And now we are at the site of the Great Pyramid. And again, something where we can scroll through, scroll around, look up, look to the sides. Okay. There we go. And just look at the sites and then say which way with the arrows there on the floor. See people, which way to move. Okay. And when we click on the arrow, take us around. There's some visitors on their camels. All right, and we can kind of explore all around us. And again, 360 views. Uh, you can look down on the ground, you know, here. Just all around your surroundings. All right, and then you could go back and then click on another one. And then it will take you to that place. Uh, so this is just another cool thing uh, provided through Google Maps. That you can explore again with the map and they'll show you major sites and you can even zoom out you know and see the wider con country 
and uh, again, take a self-guided tour. So you're able to do this on your own. Another option to explore this place. Okay, and it's like, again, you're walking along a pathway there. Okay, walking along the pyramids and being able to see everything that they have to offer. So it's just uh, pretty cool stuff. All right, for you to explore. And, uh, you know, again, just some descriptions and some things to read. And then here we go. And then look down here, they even have links to other places like there, Kennedy Space Center, which again, Florida. All right, so we just have a lot of great places just within our state. You know that you don't have to go far through. And then here we have a video. All right, on YouTube. Yeah, that you can link to as well. And it will show you a video. Okay. So, just pretty cool stuff. And then you can get back to, you know, push back a couple times and go right back out and check out some of the other places that they have to discover here. So, um, just, you know, again, it's absolutely awesome stuff that even though we might not be able to necessarily go there, we can still explore. So Machu Picchu, you're going to open that up through you visit. It's called you visit.com. Um, and it's Y O U Y O U visit.com. Okay. Another place that offers. Um, these cool things and again you can click on these different resources all right let's click for welcome sound welcome to peru's machu picchu no, no. one of the new seven wonders of the world machu picchu also a unesco world heritage site rises up more than 2400 so meters above that. sea level where the Forget amazon basin eye. meets the andes the inca chose this site above their sacred valley and completed the masterpiece in the mid 15th century so look at that it is widely held that machu picchu with its iconic stone walls, emerald green terraces, and dazzling structures, was gifted to Emperor Pachacuti as a royal estate. So look at that, you know? Just absolutely interactive and um, cool stuff to just check out, okay? So you go here and you click the little arrow that it gives you and you can go to different um, places. So let's go in the heart here. The heart of Machu Picchu provides like views of the see. city's slopes and ruins. The city was divided into agricultural and residential levels. Here in the city's heart, you can take in some of the royal residences and burial mm -hmm. grounds. Look at that. So it tells you descriptions about the site. And again, like the other ones, you can just kind of scroll around where you're at and be able to just kind of look and discover as if you were there, even the sky. Yeah, it looks a little it's a little rainy on that side. Okay. So just again, just absolute um The views from the Citadel are some of the world's most absolute prized, wealth of information. But the Inca had more in mind than valley views. The location was strategically chosen to provide astronomical observation and proximity to the gods. All right. All right, so again, um, I just wanted to share some things that you can locate, like I said, whether it's using your computer, smartphone, your tablet, um, just some things to, uh, you know, get you outside in the, the virtual sense and just be able to explore, whether it's locally here in Miami, whether it's nationally around the United States, or whether it's even outside of the country in places like Peru, and Egypt and those type of places. Um, so I hope that this video, um, again, will give you a new um, piece of uh, technology out there that you can utilize at home and, um, you know, just explore and learn new and different things, especially with those sites that had the tour guide um, telling you about them. And again, you know, 
I want to say first and foremost, if you are able to get outside your four walls, get into nature, um, take a walk, take in some fresh air, like I said, walk your dog, uh, whatever it may be, I encourage you to go ahead and do that following those safety precautions that are in place. And, um, you know, this is the biggest uh, thing that I want to push in this video. Uh, but for that time that you're inside and maybe you want to do something new and different besides maybe just watch regular videos or, uh, you know, play video games or whatever it is, uh, make sure to check out some of the things that I mentioned here, take some virtual tours. And again, you never know what you're going to be able to learn and explore and to see um, that you've never thought of before. Uh, so once again, this is Reggie. I am wishing all of you well and look forward to seeing you soon back here at the Well wow Center. Bye, everybody. guys happy thursday um today is another virtual art lesson with me miss Gato. we're going to do our craft for the week remember thursday is always craft day okay so before we get started we're going to go ahead and do our stretching we're going to continue on with our theme of sunflowers and van gogh okay so after our stretch i'll go ahead and explain what we're going to be doing for the rest of the class all right so go ahead and stretch to your left stretch to your right Stretch up, down, up, down, one more big one up, and down. Give yourself a big hug, squeeze, take a deep breath in, and relax. Way to go, guys. All right, so next up, I'm going to play a, a read-along book for you. It's called Camille's Sunflowers, and it's based on the story of Van Gogh. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and read that, and then our craft is going to be based on that. We're going to be making a coffee filter sunflower. All right, so stay tuned, listen to the story, enjoy. Camille and the Sunflowers. A story about Vincent van Gogh by Lawrence Anhold. Where Camille lived, the sunflowers grew so high, they looked like real suns a whole field of burning yellow suns. Every day after school, Camille ran through the sunflowers to meet his father, who was a postman. Together, they would lift down the heavy sacks of mail. One day, a strange man arrived in Camille's town. He had a straw hat, a yellow beard, and quick brown eyes. I am Vincent the painter, he said, smiling at Camille. Vincent came to live in the yellow house at the end of Camille Street. He had no money and no friends. Let's try to help him, said Camille's father. So they loaded the cart with pots and pans and furniture for the yellow house. Camille picked a huge bunch of sunflowers for the painter and put them in a big brown pot. Vincent was very pleased to have two good friends. Vincent asked Camille's father if he would like to have his picture painted, dressed in his best blue uniform. You must sit very still, said Vincent. Camille loved the bright colors Vincent used and the strong smell of paint. As Camille watched, his father's face appeared like magic on the canvas. The picture was strange, but very beautiful. Vincent said he would like to paint the whole family. Camille's mother, his big brother, his baby sister, and at last, Camille himself. Camille was very excited. He had never even had his picture taken with a camera. Camille took his painting to school. He wanted everyone to see it. 
but the other children didn't like the picture. They all began to laugh. This made Camille feel very sad. After school, some of the older children started teasing Vincent. They ran along behind him as he went out to paint. Even the grown-ups joined in. It's time he got a real job, they said, instead of playing with paints all day. Camille sat for hours watching Vincent work. It was very hot, but Vincent worked fast. He painted the sunflower fields and even the sun itself. He is the sunflower man, said Camille to himself. But no matter how hard Vincent worked, he could never sell any of his paintings. If I had a lot of money, said Camille, I would buy them all. Thank you, my friend, laughed Vincent. One afternoon, as Camille and Vincent were coming back from the fields, some of the children from Camille's school were waiting. They shouted at Vincent and threw stones at him. Camille wanted to stop them, but what could he do? He was only a small boy. At last, he ran home in tears. Listen, Camille, said his father. People often laugh at things that are different, but I've got a feeling that one day they will learn to love Vincent's paintings. That night, Camille had a strange dream. He saw Vincent standing in the moonlight high above the town. Vincent had stuck candles on his hat so he could see. The sunflower man was painting the stars. Early the next morning, Camille was awakened by a loud knocking at the door. Some men from the town had come to see his father. Listen, postman, they said. We want you to give this letter to your friend. It says he must pack up his paints and leave our town. Camille slipped out through the back door. He ran down the street to the yellow house. It seemed very quiet inside. Then Camille saw the sunflowers he had picked for Vincent. They had all dried up and died. Camille felt sadder than ever. Vincent was upstairs packing his bags. He looked very tired, but he smiled at Camille. Don't be sad, he said. It's time for me to paint somewhere else now. Perhaps they will like my paintings there. But first, I have something to show you. Vincent lifted down a big picture. They were Camille sunflowers, bigger and brighter than ever. Camille looked at the painting, then he smiled too. Goodbye, sunflower man, he whispered, and ran out of the yellow house and into the sunshine. Camille's father was right. People did learn to love Vincent's paintings. Today, you would have to pay a lot of money if you wanted to buy one. But now people all over the world go to museums and galleries just to see Vincent's paintings of the yellow house, of Camille and his family, and especially the picture of the sunflowers. So bright and yellow, they look like real suns. The end. Hi guys, I hope you enjoyed that story. So as promised, I'm gonna go ahead and explain our sunflower craft. Okay, before we start any craft, we have to make sure our materials are ready. So we're gonna need quite a few things for this activity. If you don't have them, it's okay. You can watch um, as I do it. And then when you get the materials, you can go ahead and attempt it on your own. Okay, so it's called coffee filter sunflower. So you're gonna need some coffee filters. You're gonna need five for this um, particular activity. You're going to need a plate or a drying rack so you can dry your coffee filters. You're gonna need some glue to assemble your flour. You're gonna need a bowl with water. You're going to need a spoon or something to mix the water. You're gonna need some yellow food coloring, okay, to get the right color for the sunflower. You're going to need some gloves, if you don't want to stain your hands, some gloves. All right, you're going to need some tape to assemble your sunflower. You're going to need a green pipe cleaner for the stem. 
you're going to need a pair of scissors to cut out your petals and some coffee. All right, so the coffee is going to be for the center of your sunflower. So go ahead and take the next two minutes to gather your materials and we'll meet right back here. guys welcome back i hope you were able to get your materials easily we're gonna go ahead and start with our coffee filter um, sunflowers so before i start anything i'm gonna go ahead and get my gloves on because i don't want to stain my hands with um the yellow food dye so i'm gonna put my gloves on okay our next step is going to be to grab our food coloring and put some drops into our bowl. Remember, depending on how dark you want your sunflowers, you're gonna go ahead and gauge that. Um, the coffee filters do absorb a lot, so I would probably put a little bit more um, yellow to darken it up a bit, almost to look like an orange shade almost. Okay, I'm gonna put it up, see if you guys can see it. Okay. I'm gonna put a few more, just because I want um, the sunflower pretty dark. All right, so I'm gonna cap it, make sure the dye doesn't get anywhere. Okay, so I'm gonna grab my spoon. I'm gonna mix it up. Okay, and I'm gonna grab my first coffee filter and place it in to the water. Okay. Dip it in there. Okay, then I'm gonna go ahead and pull it out. Okay, be very careful with the Remember the coffee filters are very delicate and you don't want them to rip. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and pull it out. Open it up so that it dries. All right, make sure there's no excess water on it. All right, so once you've done this, you're gonna go ahead and place it on your plate to dry. All right, and you're gonna go ahead and do that for the next five um, coffee filters, and then we're gonna let them dry. So I'm gonna go ahead and continue that with the other four, and then once they're dry, I'll meet right back here with you guys. In this video, I'm going to show you how to make a sunflower out of coffee filters. 
First, let me show you how to dye coffee filters to mimic the yellow color of sunflower. You're gonna need a cup of warm water and a few drops of yellow food coloring. Stir it up to get the coloring completely mixed in. Make the color darker than you think you need because the coffee filters do dry to a slightly lighter color. Now dip the coffee filter into the liquid and let it soak for a few seconds. Pull it out and put it on a rack to dry. You can use a cooling rack but I don't have one so I just flip this basket over to use as a rack. Go in with another coffee filter. You're gonna need 5 coffee filters to make one flower. When they're completely dry, you're ready to make the sunflower. First, fold the coffee filter in half. Then in half again to make a triangle. Fold the triangle in half like so. And do it one more time. Now take your scissors and cut it into petal shape. Make sure the tip is pointy to mimic the sunflower petals. Open it and you got yourself the first layer. Repeat the same steps 4 more times to make 5 layers like this. Use Mod Podge to glue them together. After you're done gluing, you can use a piece of brown felt to make a center for your flower or you can use seed beads to make it look more realistic. Put a generous amount of Mod Podge in the center of the flower. Sprinkle the beads on. Arrange them with your fingers then let it dry for a few hours. Since the center of the flower is very big, I'm going to add another coat of Mod Podge and sprinkle some more beads on. Let it dry. When it's completely dry, flip it over to get rid of any beads that won't glue on. And your sunflower is done. If you enjoyed this video, you might also want to check out my coffee filter daisy tutorial. I'll leave the link in the description box too in case you're on a mobile device. I hope you found the tutorial helpful. Please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for more videos like this. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Welcome back guys, my coffee filters are completely dry. So we're going to go on to our next step. Okay, so we're going to do these one by one and I'm going to show you just how we're going to cut the petals out. Okay, so we're going to grab our circles. We're going to fold it in half so that it looks like a taco, like a taco shell. Okay, then we're going to fold it again in half. Okay, again. And one more time. Okay, so at this point you should have a really thin triangle. Okay, now once we have this, we're going to grab our scissors. I want to cut it out in the shape of a petal. Okay, so we're going to make it a little pointy at the edges so that we get a nice petal. Okay, once we've done that, we're going to open it up and we should have the first layer of our sunflower. All right, and there you have it, first layer. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and do that four more times. Okay, so bear with me, give me just a few minutes to get those again. Fold it in half, half again. Half again. And again. Okay, now it's time to cut. Okay, it's gonna be our second layer. Remember, there's five, so we're only on two. Okay, and then we're going to go ahead and open it up again. Okay, 
Alrighty. Second layer. Remember when you layer them on top, you don't have to put them directly, you know, on top. So give it some texture and you can move it to the side so that it has more dimension and more texture. Okay. We still have three more to do. So again, I'm gonna fold this one in half. Got our taco shell. And half again. Half again. And again. There you go. Now we're gonna go ahead and cut our petal. Remember and point it at the top. So it gives you that nice sunflower petal. Okay, let's open it up. See what it looks like. That'll be our third layer. Okay, we have two more. Again, here we go with our taco shell. Half. And again. Okay, time to cut. And then we have one more petal. This one, open it up. There you go. And we have one more layer. Okay, our last layer of our sunflower. And top again. Half. And one more. Okay, so now it should be a really thin. Triangle again. I get it. Grab our scissors. Make the pointed edge for our petal. And again on this side. Okay, open it up. See what it looks like. They should all look similar, but none of them are going to be completely identical just because you're freehanding it. Um, so your petals will be a little bit different, but same general idea. That's our last one. Now we're going to go ahead and grab our glue to assemble it. Okay, so we're going to open up our glue. So for this activity, the best glue is going to be this one, your liquid one. Okay, right in the center of your sunflower. You're going to add some. Okay, so this one looks like might be clogged. Go ahead and clean off the top. There we go. All right, so I'm gonna apply some glue right in the middle. And I'm gonna go ahead and start layering. I'm gonna grab another one. And right in the middle, I'm gonna go ahead and place it there. Okay, then I'm gonna go ahead and grab another one. I'm gonna grab another layer of Sunflower, place it again in the middle. Some more glue. Another layer. Remember, you don't have to put them completely, you know, identical stock. You can move them so it can give your flower more dimension, more shape. All right, and we're gonna add one more, our last layer. So right now, this is what your sunflower should look like. Okay, we're gonna give this um, a few minutes to dry in the center so that we can go ahead and add our coffee in the middle to complete our sunflower with our stem. All right guys, while we wait for our sunflower to dry, I'm gonna start working on the stem. Okay, so I'm gonna use another a lighter green pipe cleaner to add some leaves to our um, stem. Okay, so I'm gonna cut it a little bit and I'm going to make a leaf shape. Okay, so I'm going to open it up a bit and then 
There you go. Okay, and I'm gonna wrap this around my original like cleaner. Okay. So that'll be one, and then I'm gonna add another one on the other side. We'll make it a little bit bigger. All right, so same deal. I'm gonna go ahead, twist it, open it up, and then, okay. I'm going to place it almost at the same level, just on the other side. Again, I'm going to go ahead and twist it. Okay, and you can mold it however you want. Okay, so that's going to be our stem. Our sunflower is almost completely dry, so while the center dries, I'm just going to attach my stem to my sunflower. You can always move this a little down depending on um, the placement of the flower. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and grab my tape. Cut a piece off. I'm gonna flip sunflower upside down and attach To the back. Okay, I'm going to add several pieces just to secure it so I don't want it to fall. Okay, another piece here. And one more. Just to be sure. Okay, so for right now, this is what our sunflower is looking like. Okay, so we have our coffee filter sunflower, we have our pipe cleaner stem and leaves. We're gonna give it a few more minutes to dry in the center so that we can add our coffee. Time for our final step. I'm gonna go ahead and grab my sunflower. I'm gonna put some glue right in the center. Okay, I'm gonna do, sorry, I had to open it first, right? I'm gonna do a circle in the middle. Okay, and I'm gonna grab my spoon and my coffee, and I'm just gonna sprinkle it on top. I'm gonna pat it on. Okay, and I'm gonna shake off the excess. All right, guys, and there you have it. Here is your coffee filter sunflower. I hope you guys have fun that you're able to do this on your own. Okay, remember, as always, make sure you bring your work to our Zoom meetings. Um, we love to see it. Um, take pictures, tag us on Instagram, Facebook, any social media platform. Um, we love to see your work and to share it with um, everyone. All right, so we'll see you next time, and I wish you well.
love y'all. Hopefully you enjoyed yesterday, the special guest artist I had, Monique, and you enjoyed the dance moves with her, and I've got some really great things planned for you today as well. Let's get started. Give an air five to a friend next to ya. Give an air five and sing la la. Give an air five to a friend next to ya. Give an air five and sing. Sing la la. Everybody sing. La 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 What are the other things we did yesterday? Can you remember? That's right, what I'm doing right now. Smile to a friend, to a friend next to ya. Smile to a friend and sing la la. Smile to a friend, to a friend next to ya. Smile to a friend and sing. Sing la la. It can really change someone's day, just a simple smile. La 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 or on your front porch. Wave to a friend, to a friend next to ya. Wave to a friend and sing la la. Wave to a friend, to a friend next to ya. Wave to a friend and sing me. Sing la la. Everybody now. La 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 Good job, everybody. I can feel that. Excellent. So today is International Jazz Day. We've got some cool days this week. Space Week, International Dance Day, and today, International Jazz Day. So jazz is a specific kind of music that I want you to learn about. And I have a special guest who's going to show you an instrument that he plays jazz on. So without further ado, this is going to be a very special session of love, hope, music. So I'm gonna introduce right now, Michael and Matt, who have brought love, hope, music for the past more than a year to WOW Center. And we've been really blessed to have them. And they're gonna introduce our special artist. So you guys have fun. See you next time, I wish you well. Hey everyone, happy International Jazz Day. We miss taking love, hope, music to you all so much. Yeah, but we're really excited to be here today to be able to present you with Ambassador of Hope, someone you may remember, Mario Guinea, and he's gonna be bringing a special guest as well, so please enjoy. We'll always remember the year 1938 as the year the jazz went legit. Mr. Benny Goodman, the original Benny Goodman Quartet. Hello everybody, happy Monday. Welcome, WOW Center. Thank you for having me, all the students and all the faculty members. My name is Mario, Mario Guini, and I am a musician, an artist. I play guitar. I also sing and write music. Um, I've been on tour and working for many years now with Mark Anthony, as well as artists like Jennifer Lopez and Talia, and among many others as well. I have done recordings for a lot of Latin artists, pop records. 
I played in a bunch of rock bands, jazz bands, I did some Broadway music, and one of my favorite genres of music is jazz. So I hope you guys like jazz. <laughs> jazz is a little bit different than other styles of music. It's more inclined for improvisation. So you will tend to make a lot of things up uh, on the spot, improvise, so something brand new every time you play jazz. And originally, from what I know from jazz, I love the, the, that kind of music and it's one of the hardest styles of music to play. So if you guys love jazz, give me a thumbs up. There's a lot of saxophone, a lot of piano, a lot of drums, a lot of trumpets, all kinds of instruments. So. I went to New York City when I was 18 uh, or 19 years old and I studied with a bunch of different musicians out in New York City where a big jazz movement, movement happened um, in the 50s and jazz originally started around 1920s maybe even earlier than that and it has its roots uh, down south from the New Orleans, Mississippi more of the southern states. So um, what happens, there's a big mixture of American and African cultures and music mixing together, as well as European styles, from Italy, Spain, uh, so uh, a lot of classical music as well. But the roots was in the American, African folk, blues music. Um, so you have a lot of this influence roots, uh, what was originally called rhythm and blues, turned into ragtime, Dixieland music, swing music, so jazz used to be dancing. So if you guys like to dance, I like to dance, jazz is great for dancing, especially older jazz from the 1920s, maybe earlier ragtime music. So I'm going to perform a song, maybe two songs for you guys, improvise a little bit, I hope you guys enjoy it. Maybe you can dance, if not, you can listen and listen for the instruments. I'm going to play guitar and I'm going to have a very special guest who is a flautist from Cuba and her name is Evelyn Suarez. She plays the flute, the Trevor's flute, I believe it's called, um, and she plays jazz and Latin jazz. So there's many different styles, styles of jazz, there's not just one jazz, there's jazz rock, jazz, Latin jazz, uh, straight ahead jazz, bebop, you guys ever heard of bebop? Like that. <laughs> so have fun, enjoy, listen, there's many great jazz artists that you can go find on the internet. And I can give you some recommendations, um, just to name a few. Listen to Louis Armstrong, Louis Armstrong, L-O-U-I-S, and also Ella Fitzgerald, Ella, E-L-L-A. -L -L she is an amazing jazz singer. Um, I'll also recommend some big band jazz, swing. Um, I think Duke Ellington comes to mind. Uh, another name that I remember uh, I read recently was Roy Elridge. Um, so you can definitely look up Duke Ellington. It's probably one of my favorites. Oh, there's also Benny Goodman. Benny Goodman. There's also Benny Golson. And so those are some good big band jazz that you can look up. And another, star, another artist that I enjoy myself is you can look up uh, Dizzy. Dizzy Gillespie or Charlie Parker. Charlie Parker. That's a, that's a good one to remember. They used to call him the bird. Like a bird. Charlie Parker. So that's Charlie Parker. And then after a little bit more uh, newer jazz started with Miles Davis. So you can look up Miles Davis. There's a documentary on Netflix if you guys are interested that's very good. Um, so all that music is really nice. That goes from 1920s, maybe earlier, up until 1950, 1960. And then in 1970, jazz started becoming more, uh, not so much dancing, but more just listening or 
fusions between jazz and rock and roll. There was a lot of rock bands um, that started fusing jazz, a lot of uh, funkier music, uh, the blues and definitely funk. So you, you get a lot of these pop influences with jazz now. So enjoy it, listen, have fun. Um, I hope you guys like the guitar because guitar is one of my favorite instruments. This is a acoustic guitar. Okay. And the guitar was never really a jazz instrument because it was always acoustic. So the jazz would always be like, uh, the guitar would always play rhythm. So you have what's very common in jazz, it's called swing. So you swing, are you swinging? The jazz, if it's swinging, then it's good. It doesn't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. That's what they say in jazz. So with the guitar, you used to play more rhythm like that. So that kind of fusing. So that's a lot of some some of what you know uh, you're gonna hear when you listen to jazz. You're gonna hear the drums. So the drums usually go ding 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 one two three four one two. You're gonna hear the bass. The bass is gonna go. Like an example of a jazz song. That's a song by Miles Davis called So What. I hope you guys enjoy that. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you you like all the singers that I recommend. So go look up Louis Armstrong, Ella Fitzgerald, Duke Ellington, Charlie Parker, The Bird, Miles Davis, and who else can we look up? I would say John Coltrane. And Bill Evans, the piano player, is one of my favorite jazz piano players. But there are many jazz musicians out there. They, they're all amazing, fun to listen to, and all a bunch of different styles. So you're always going to find something that you like. So enjoy. Happy Jazz Day. Happy International Jazz Day. I love you guys. God bless. And thank you for taking care of everybody out there. Wow Center, all the students. Hi, hi students. And all the faculty members, thank you teachers and for sharing this video. Go look me up if you like my music. It's called Monte Grande. And you can follow me on YouTube and Apple Music and everywhere. So thank you guys. Song called Straight No Chaser. <laughs>
This is a song called In a Sentimental Mood.
today I'm going to be doing a lesson on good manners, good table manners. Um, this is really important for not just your job, but also your regular life outside of work. Whenever you go out to a restaurant or you go to a family dinner for Christmas or another holiday, if you have bad table manners, it just doesn't look nice. Um, so this lesson today is going to be for that and to help you guys um, learn these little tricks and tips so that next time you go out to dinner after this quarantine, you guys will be the have the best manners on the table and everyone will realize um, what a great person you are to go out to eat with. And this is important for all of us. When I was little, my parents used to drill this in me too. There are just certain things you shouldn't do at the table. And this lesson is for that. This is also important for your job because if you do work in the food industry, some of you guys were recently hired at Pollo Tropical, it's important to also know table side manners because it's gonna help you serve your clients better. And when you're at lunch at work, you also don't wanna be eating like a crazy slob or something because that just doesn't look good at work either. So I hope that these tips are helpful for you guys. And if you have any questions, please let me know, okay? So we're gonna be reading a book today and it's called Good Table Manners, okay? So I'm gonna begin. Welcoming guests. When guests come to your house, greet them at the door. Place their coats on hangers. Do not toss them in a big wad on the floor. Shake their hands and hug relatives. Even Aunt Edna, who has stinky breath and false teeth. So the next page says, sitting at the table. Be a pal, pull a chair out for a lady. Hold it steady while she scoots up to the table. Find your seat and sit up straight near the table. Place your napkin on your lap. Do not plop your elbows on the table. You do not want to look like a barbarian at a feast. Did you know? In France, it is rude to have your hands under the table. Hands should be above the table at all times. So what is this talking about? There's a lot of information here, so I'm gonna take it step by step. First it says, be a pal. When someone has a hard time maybe getting to the table, you can help them by pulling the chair for them and helping them slowly scoot in. The other thing it says is that um, once you do sit at the, at the table, you should sit up straight, you should put your napkin, you should sit up straight and close to the table, you should get your napkin and you can put it on your lap. You don't have to put it on your lap always. It's usually for restaurants or for fancy dinners. You can also just leave it on the table. Do not flop your elbows on the table. You don't want to look like a barbarian at a feast. So don't, you don't have to lean on the table like this. You're not bored. You're not bored of eating. So you should sit up straight, keep your hands on the table, but you don't have to keep your elbows on the table. It also said that in France, it's rude to have your hands underneath the table. And I can see why. The next uh, page says, wait your turn. Wait for everyone to be served. Hosts should pick up their fork before you begin eating. Do not reach for food across the table. Pass food to your left and take only as much as you think you can eat. Do not pile a mountain of mashed potatoes on your plate. Did you know it's polite for guests to eat first in Afghanistan. It should also eat there. Eat, they should also eat the most. So, what is this page about? It's saying that here in America, usually, you should, if you're invited to go out to eat at somebody's house, you should wait for the host to eat first. So, if you went to your friend's house for dinner, and their parents are there too, you should wait for her parents or their parents to start eating before you start eating. Um, it also says that you shouldn't reach across the table, across someone else's plate for food. You can just ask them, hey, can you pass the butter? Or hey, can you pass the bread? Thank you. When you do pass food, you should always pass it to your left. And in this case, on video, it's to your left that way. Okay? And when you put food on your plate, don't put too much food that you're never gonna finish because then it's gonna have to go in the trash and that's a waste of food. So only serve as much as you think you can eat. 
Then it said, where in the did you know that it's polite for guests to eat first in Afghanistan? So that's another country. And in that country, guests can eat first instead of the host. The next page says, all that silverware. Sometimes you will see extra knives and forks, some even above the plates. Use the outside fork first and do not use your knife to pick the food out of your teeth. Bread plates are placed, on, are placed to the left of your dinner plate. Choose a piece of bread or a roll. Tear, a cut off, tear or cut off a bit, then put butter on that piece. Don't try to tear it apart with your teeth. Crumbs might fly across the table. Okay, so that was a lot of information. So sometimes, it's, you've probably seen it if you go to a wedding, you've seen that tables are full of forks and knives and some are big and some are small. And what do they all mean? So each of those forks and knives are used to eat at different meals. Some are for dessert, some are for the salad, some are for the meal. It says, use the outside fork first. So always use the one that's on the outside. It's also usually the bigger one. Also, don't use a knife to pick the food out of your teeth. If you have food in your teeth, you can go to the bathroom and use floss, or you can use a toothpick and cover your mouth when you do it. There's also sometimes going to be a bread plate placed to the left of your dinner plate. Choose a piece of bread or a, a, a bun or a roll that you want and cut or tear a piece off. And then you put butter on that piece. Don't bite on it like it's an apple because crumbs might go everywhere and that would be kind of gross for the person sitting next to you. The next page says, a mouthful. It is not polite to talk or chomp with your mouth full. Do not stuff too much in. You can do all these things when you are at a hot dog eating contest, just not at grandma's table. Bring food from the plate to your mouth. Do not drop your face into the bowl. Leave that move for Rover. And if you have to leave the table to go to the bathroom, place your napkin on your chair. Say, please excuse me. Did you know, if you are dining in China, don't eat all the food on your plate. The host will think you are rude. Leaving a little makes you a good guess. Alrighty, so it says there's a lot of information on every page, so I'm gonna go little by little telling you guys about it. When you're eating, you shouldn't stuff your mouth full and blah, 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 because it doesn't look really nice. And that you also shouldn't talk with your mouth full because people can see all your food. Um, you can do, it says you can do that at a hot dog eating contest, but not at the dinner table. And then it says, bring the food from the plate to your mouth. You shouldn't dig your face in like a dog. Um, and because that just doesn't look very nice. You should bring, that's why we have the fork. Bring the fork to your mouth with the food. And if you have to go to the bathroom or leave the table for a minute, always say, please excuse me. Okay. Here it says you can leave the napkin on your chair, but you can also just leave it on the side of your plate. The next page says, finger food? Do not slurp or lick your fingers. Who wants to listen to that? It's a no-no to stick your finger in cake icing, no matter how good it looks. And do not dip your chip twice in that ranch dip. No one wants your germs. Only eat with your fingers if the food is supposed to be eaten that way. Don't grab your pork chop like a caveman, but pick up your tacos. It also depends where you are. Even french fries are eaten with a fork at fancy restaurants. Did you know, in Japan, slurping your noodle soup is a good thing. It is even better to slurp really loudly. It tells your host that you are thankful for the good meal. Okay, so let's start. When you're eating at a restaurant or at your friend's house, you do that in cartoons, but you really shouldn't do that in real life. You shouldn't lick your fingers. You should use a napkin. Um, we should never put our finger to the icing on cakes, no matter how good it looks. When you have a chip or maybe a wing or something that you're dipping into a sauce and you're sharing the sauce with everyone, you should not double dip. Why? Because nobody wants your germs, especially now with the coronavirus. 
you really don't want to double dip because you can get someone sick. And then it says that you should only eat finger food. It's supposed to be, you should only eat food with your fingers if it's supposed to be eaten with your fingers. Um, so that means if you're gonna eat a taco, you should use your hands. You can't eat a taco with a fork and knife. But um, if you're eating chicken or pork chops, you should probably use your fork and knife. But it also depends where you are, it says. At a really fancy restaurant, you even eat french fries with a fork. So you have to figure out that if you're in a really fancy place, maybe it's best to use a fork and knife. Next page says, no thanks. Learn how to refuse a food politely. Not everyone likes the same things. If it's a new food, try a tiny bite. You might like it more than you think. If you don't feel like eating fish eggs or frog legs, it's better to say, no thank you. Do not say, that food smells rotten. You might hurt the host's feelings. Remember that it takes a lot of effort to make dinner for guests. Think of that before you say something bad about the food. Alrighty, so I know a lot of us might be picky eaters. So when we go to somebody's house and they offer us something that we don't want to eat, should we be like, ew, that's gross. I hate eating avocado. Or ew, that's gross. I don't want frog legs. Ew. No, we should say, no, thank you. I'll pass, thank you. So you should politely say, no, thank you, okay? That's really, really important because it takes a long time to make somebody lunch or dinner. And for someone to say, ew, that's gross. Or like, I don't eat that. That would really suck. Um, and then it also says that like, maybe if you've never tried it before, you can give it a shot. You don't know how many times I've tasted something that I didn't think I would like and I ended up loving it. So give it a shot if you've never tried it before. The next page says, after you eat, the meal is done. Now what? Say something nice to the cook and the host. Thank them for the delicious food. If the food tasted yucky, you could say, the flowers on the table are so pretty. Wait to be excused from the table. Until then, stay seated. Listen to what guests are talking about. Join in if you'd like. It, it is fun being a guest, right? Don't forget, you should always thank your host for asking you to dinner. So, when you're done eating, you can thank the host and the cook for what they did. So, in my family, we always thank, if my dad made a barbecue, we always thank him for the barbecue. Everybody claps, all the guests clap for the, for the chef. Um, and you could do that when you go out too, to see to a friend's house or a family member's house. After the food is over, say, thank you, grandma. Thank you, grandpa. Um, but maybe if the food was gross, what do you say? Maybe you can say, oh, the flowers on the table are so pretty. Or I love, I loved the decoration. Or you can talk about something else that you liked. And then you should wait, you should talk a little bit at the table. You can, you don't have to get up and leave as soon as you're done. Um, you can stay around and wait for everybody to get up and be excused. So it's good table manners to after you're done eating to talk a little bit at the table. Talk about the day, talk about current events. That's why some of your goals are to learn current events. Um, you can talk about that at the table. Next page says, a bit more polite. Now you know which fork to use. You know which way to pass the pasta. Before long, you will wow everyone with your great table manners. You might even be invited back for dinner. Practice your manners to make them perfect. Before long, your manners will be finger licking good. Alrighty, so guys, that was just an overall about being polite. I hope that you learned a little bit about that and I hope that you can take these new things home and when we're out done with quarantine, especially when you go over for friends' houses because everybody's gonna be wanting our friends to come over now because we're all tired of staying home, your family and your friends are gonna invite you for dinner quite a lot when you're done with the quarantine. So practice these things at home now with your family, practice being kind and polite at the table, and it's good manners to eat nice with your family too. You should practice it all the time with your family. Alrighty, um, so there's going to be a 
quick quiz that you guys can take after the lesson is over. I'll send you, um, at the end, you'll have all of the questions and you guys can talk about it with your friends or with your family or whoever's with you. I'll read the questions for you. The best time to begin eating is when, number two, when you want someone to pass the green beans, you should, well, I'll read, I'm going to read the questions for you and the answers and all the answers and then you can answer them on your own later for your assignment. The best time to begin eating is when A, the food comes to the table, B, the clock in the front hall begins to chime, C, when you feel like it, D, everyone has been served and your host picks up their forks. Number two. When you want someone to pass the green beans, you should A. Shove others out of the way and go get them yourself. B. Run around the table and scream, give me the green beans. C. Say, please pass me the green beans. D. Throw yourself down on the ground and have a screaming fit. Number three. The best way to pass food around the table is to throw rolls one by one to each person. Put the food in the middle of the table and let people grab it. C, pass, put the food back in the kitchen. Say, if you want, go get it. D, pass it to your left. Number four, to tidy up the dinner table, be sure to wipe your mouth and fingers on your shirt, wipe your mouth and fingers on your tablecloth, use a napkin to wipe your mouth and fingers, Pick the food out of your teeth with a knife. Number five, if you did not like the food your host served, you can say, next time, let's order pizza. This was yucky. Number B, this was yucky. I'll bring a sandwich next time. C, thanks for inviting me. Or D, couldn't you think of something better to serve? And number six, if you want to act like a barbarian, you can A, Talk with your mouth full. B, stuff too much food in your mouth. C, chomp with your mouth open. Or D, all of the above. All right guys, so those are some questions. Feel free to answer them after. You can write the answers down on a piece of paper when you're done with the lesson. I hope you enjoyed this. And real quick before we go, I'm just gonna review some Glossary words. Glossary is vocabulary words that maybe we didn't know before. Okay, so really quick. Barbarian. A barbarian is a person who is wild and without manners. A barbarian has horrible ta table manners. Barbarians were people a long time ago that lived usually in, they lived mostly in a different part of the world. They lived closer to Denmark and um, and England and Norway and they were basically Vikings but some people call them barbarians because they thought that they didn't have good manners. So that's why today when we talk about a barbarian it's talking about someone who does not have good manners. Excused. When you are not excused you are given permission to not do something. Were you excused from the table? So excuse me when someone says, all right, I'll see you later. You can get up from the table. Or when you ask to go to the bathroom and someone at school and someone says, yes, you can go. That's when you're excused. Invited. To be invited is to be asked to do something or go somewhere. Marcy invited me over for dinner. Perfect. Something that is perfect does not, all, does not have any flaws or mistakes. My table manners are perfect now. Polite. To be polite is to have good manners. It is polite to put your napkin on your lap. Relatives. Relatives are members of your family. It is fun to have dinner with relatives. Alrighty guys, I'll see you later and I hope you enjoyed this lesson. Bye! Hi everybody. Today I wanted to tell you about an app that I have on my phone. It tells me about all the different national days that we celebrate or can celebrate in this country. We've talked about some of them while we've been doing our virtual programming. For example, National Tartan Day, Earth Day, 
National Superhero Day. So I looked to see what was going on today, and today is National Raisin Day. So I thought that was sort of interesting. I said to myself, what's the history of Raisin Day? So I looked it up and I printed up a paper here. I'm going to read you what it says about National Raisin Day. So it says the first National Raisin Day was celebrated in 1909 and promoted by the raisin growers of California. Advertisements placed in papers and on the radio, flyers delivered door to door leading up to the day included recipes, deals, and announcements reminding everybody to celebrate National Raisin Day on April the 30th. When the day arrived, restaurants, dining cars, hotels, and steamships around the country included dishes featuring the dried fruit. Schools, local and state governments were involved in providing education and information about the quality of California raisins and their health benefits. What started out slowly soon exploded into an annually celebrated event. So I said to myself, let's learn a little bit more about raisins. What are raisins? So raisins are basically dried grapes. So I have a bowl of grapes here and I said to myself, some grapes are darker and some are lighter. And most of the raisins we get are dark, are very brown. So what makes the difference? I said, let me look into that too. So I checked and I looked it up online and it says, black raisins are the most common type. Uh, they can be made from grapes of any skin color. The higher the temperature and the more direct sunlight that they, that's used to dry them, the darker the raisins and the more caramelized the flavor. So raisins are dried grapes. They tend, some are sun dried, they dry them out in the sun. Or nowadays, more of them are mechanically dehydrated. But apparently it doesn't matter what color the grape is. Uh, the raisins color depends on how long they've been dried. So for example, these ones are dark colored raisins. These are the ones most people get. You get all different brands of them. This is Publix brand, you get Del Monte, things like this. Um, then another kind of raisin you can get are the golden raisins. So from my understanding, from what we just read, is that these ones are yellow because they have not been dried at such a big heat or for as long as the darker ones. So raisins, think about it. What's good about raisins? We read before that most of them, that um, National Raisin Day started in California. So um, I read also that California produces most of the world's raisins. So they're a big producer of grapes and raisins. You like raisins? These little ones in the small boxes are great little snack packs. We said raisins are dried grapes. What food group do grapes come from? They're fruit, exactly. So. Just because you dried them doesn't change what they are. They're still a fruit. So if you're eating raisins, they would count towards your fruit allowance for the day. So they're low in fat, naturally low in fat, and they contain healthy nutrients. And yet they're sweet. So they're a great little snack to have. And these little packs probably produce a serving size. Okay, and that's about, I just read on back here, about 90 calories in one of the small boxes. So I checked my, the app on my phone again, and it turns out that today is also National Oatmeal Cookie Day. So I tried to find out a little bit more about National Oatmeal Cookie Day. And the best I could find is that it is observed each year on April the 30th. So not much about it. It says that the, the cookies became popular um, in the early 1900s as a, when a recipe for delicious treats appeared on the containers of Quaker Oats. Oatmeal cookies are also considered a health food because they are an excellent source of iron and fiber. And just another reason to have an oatmeal cookie today. So we have National Raisin Day. We have National Oatmeal Cookie Day. It made sense. Let's combine them. 
So our lesson for today, we are actually going to be making oatmeal raisin cookies. The oatmeal, we just said, is a great source of iron and fiber. And the grapes have, um, they're naturally low in fat and they contain healthy nutrients. So combine them and we actually get a very healthy cookie. So that's our plan for today. Join me back here in a minute and we are going to start making some no-bake oatmeal raisin cookies. Right, so here we are in the kitchen. We learned a little bit about National Raisin Day and about where raisins come from. And we learned a bit about National Oatmeal Cookie Day. And I said we were going to put those two together and we are going to make oatmeal raisin cookies. So there is a recipe attached with, uh, with your lesson today that are no bake oatmeal raisin cookies. So that means we don't have to put them in the oven. And that's what we're gonna be working on today. It's, um, there are only four ingredients, so it should be fairly simple. If you do need help, make sure you ask for help first, okay? So we're gonna do our um, hygiene and everything first. We're gonna do our quick spray down of the counter. Make sure we keep it clean. And then, of course, my next step is to wash my hands. So let's get that done. And we've practiced this many times before. So we all know how long to do it for, right? 20 seconds or two happy birthday songs. Getting in between your fingers, nails, your thumbs, wrists, good and clean. Get rid of those germs. Okay. And dry. Okay, so back to our workspace. And in order to save a little time, I've got everything prepared ahead of time. So I have everything I need. I've got my utensils and my ingredients. So we're going to go over them one by one so that you can see what we need. And then I'll give you a minute to go and get your own. So the recipe calls for oatmeal. Okay, so I'm using a Publix brand of oatmeal. It's a little cheaper, but most of you would know Quaker oatmeal. Any kind of oatmeal works, okay? So oatmeal. The second ingredient will be peanut butter. And again, Publix brand, I'm very happy with that. And uh, I personally prefer the creamy peanut butter. I'm pretty sure you can make these cookies with crunchy peanut butter if that's your preference. So, um, just to let you know about some substitutions, if you, uh, you can actually get uh, gluten-free oats if you need that for your health. And for peanut butter, you could use either almond butter or cashew butter, if that's something you prefer. Then it calls for some honey. Look at that, again, Publix brand. I, I do not like my Publix brand, so I've got honey. Uh, the recipe also says if you prefer, you could use maple syrup or agave syrup. And the final ingredient, which we saw earlier today, are the raisins for National Raisin Day. So um, the recipe also says you can add in some chocolate chips. I don't think I'm gonna add chocolate chips into mine, but that's a choice you can make. I prefer to stick with the basic four ingredients. Okay, so our utensils that we're gonna need, we're gonna need a mixing bowl. Okay, a nice clean mixing bowl, a spatula, that's going to be to scrape and to help stir. Parchment paper, um, and I think if you don't have parchment paper, it's okay. This is just to help to stop the cookies from sticking onto the cookie sheet, which I have here. But and it helps with cleanup too. So if you don't have parchment paper, it's okay. Uh, this again available in Publix. And the last thing, of course, is a measuring cup. So if we go over the recipe quickly, it's got one and a half cups of quick oats. So we're going to be measuring up on the measuring cup here and the peanut butter. So a two cup measure is big enough to do our whole um, recipe. So there we have all the utensils and all our ingredients. And these are ingredients that most people would have in their house anyway. Okay, you, don't pro you probably don't have to make a special trip to the supermarket to get these. So at this point, I'm going to give you a few minutes to go gather your utensils and your ingredients, all the supplies that you need, and to get your work surface clean, 
and wash your hands. Also, if you need help, now's the time to go get somebody to help you. Don't work in the kitchen without permission and without getting help, okay? Okay, so here we are back. Hopefully you had time to get everything you needed. And we're going to use our recipe and follow the steps. So step one says, line your cookie sheet with the parchment paper. So you just take it out the same way you do with your saran wrap or your, your foil. Just sort of measure how much you're gonna need. You're not gonna need too much. Rip it gently. Now be careful because these serrated edges can be very sharp, okay? I found that out the hard way once. So be careful with that. And if you put the parchment paper the, the curry side down, it lies a little flatter. So we've lined our cookie sheet with the parchment paper and we're setting it aside. So in a large bowl, we're going to put all our ingredients together. So this is how easy this recipe is. You just put them all in a bowl together. So first ingredient is one and a half cups of oats. I'm going to pop this off. And the one and a half is right to there, okay? So one cup goes about halfway up, one and a half. Here we go. So we're going to pour it. And this is one of these um, recipes where you don't have to have exact measurements, but you want to be very close. So shake it down gently and look at it from the side to see what you've got. Um, I've got maybe just a tad too much so I can pour a little bit back. Shake it again. And there you go. We're right at about a cup and a half of oats. So put that in first. Pour it gently in there. Try not to spill it. Okay. Our next ingredient is half a cup of peanut butter. So this one's going to get a little messier. I'm going to use my spatula to scrape it out. And this one's going to be a little harder. Let's check where we're going to go to. The half cup is right about there. Okay, so not too much. Put some in and just see what we've got so far. We need more than that. And like I said, it doesn't have to be exact, but we are going to need enough peanut butter to hold these things together because that's the, the, the substance going to hold the oats together. So I think we're actually fairly close there. I'll put just a little bit more and just more than just going to, some will come off the spatula. So. Okay, so we're going to put all this in with our oats. You get your rubber spatula, it really scrapes off the edges and you can get almost all of the peanut butter out of there. Okay, it's fairly clear. So let's go back to our recipe. And our next ingredient is half a cup of honey. So we're going to do the same thing. Set that aside. I like the little honey bear here. And we're just going to squeeze the honey out of the top. And again, the half cup. Okay. So we're going to squeeze it out. I'm going to ignore that phone call. Squeeze my honey. I like honey. I put I use honey a lot in breakfast. I'll have toast with butter and honey on top. I really enjoy that. And it's taking a little longer than I expected, but there we go, it's almost there. Okay, let's look at that. And there you have it, half a cup of honey. We did it. So again, we're going to use our spatula to scrape that out. These are some of my favorite things all mixed together. I think I'm going to enjoy these cookies. I 
And then my final ingredient is going to be the quarter cup of raisins. So a quarter cup, of course, is half of the half cup. So the half cup is to here. You're going to have a quarter cup right here. Okay, so we're going to do that. I washed my hands, so I'm going to touch the raisins here. Scrape them out, and that's looking pretty good. So in they go. So let's go over again the four ingredients we put in there. We put in our one and a half cups of oatmeal, half a cup of peanut butter, half a cup of honey, and a quarter of a cup of raisins. So we are going to stir these, it says mix well until combined, so until they're all mixed together. So it's going to be a little sticky, the honey and the peanut butter are both sort of sticky. Give them a good stir. Mix in, make sure you get all that dry oats mixed in with the honey and the peanut butter. Okay, it's starting to form a nice little ball. I'm going to scrape the stuff off the spatula and keep stirring. I've got a visitor down beside me here who thinks it smells pretty good, but this isn't for dogs. This is peanut food. Although a lot of dogs do like peanut butter, I heard. So. Okay, so I think I've done fairly well. Got it mixed up. They're all combined. There are no dry bits of oats anywhere. Um, the raisins seem to be mixed in fairly well. So let's see what our next step is. It says using your hands form 12 small balls and now it, it says 12 i think whatever you feel like doing if you want bigger cookies you make fewer and if you want smaller cookies you make more um, as i've been touching all the jars and everything else and i'm going to be using my hands i'm going to just quickly rinse off my hands one more time before i start making the balls and i'm also going to take off um, my ring because i don't want to get peanut butter inside that so we'll put that again so I'm going to quick rinse off with a little bit of soap, just make sure it's clean. Okay, and I think it's going to get a little bit messy here. So, you take a small amount, just kind of roll it into a ball, and place it on the cookie sheet. So we'll see, I've got two so far. We can count them as we go along, see how many we make. That's three. Ooh, this one's got a lot of raisins in it. Four. Five. They smell good. They smell lots of peat butter. Now, of course, I mentioned earlier, if, if you're, for some reason, if you're allergic to peanut butter or you don't care for peanut butter, you can substitute or use something different. You can use almond butter or uh, I think it's a cashew butter. I've never used either of those. I, I, I just, I like peanut butter, so that's what I use. Again, if you wanted to use your chocolate chips instead of the raisins, or you could add chocolate chips as well. Uh, but raisins would be your healthier choice because, of course, they come from grapes. We talked about that earlier. So they are fruit. So 9, 10. I'm at 10. Oh, we're going to get more than 12 off this. 11. 12. They were making theirs bigger. 13. 14. Whoa, they have money. Quite a few more. 
I actually don't think I'm going to have space for them all on my cookie sheet. I've ended up going off the edge of the parchment paper, but that's okay. My hands are getting stickier as we go. Okay, so then it says um, we can push those down and just make them more of a cookie shape. Right now they're a ball, so cookies are generally like a flat circle. So we're just going to push them down a bit, flatten them out. My hands are sticky, so. Okay. And then it says, if you want to, you can add some chocolate chips to decorate on the top. Um, I'm not going to do that, but um, if you choose to do that, that's fine. So what we're going to do here, we're going to take a quick break. We've got them ready to go. From here, we're going to stick them in the refrigerator. We're going to refrigerate them for 30 minutes. So while they are in the refrigerator, we're going to clean up our work area.
clean my kitchen up, put everything away, and I'm going to take those uh, cookies out of the freezer, the refrigerator. So here they are. They're looking quite good, but the only way to find out whether they are good is to taste them. So see how they're much more solid now that they've been in the refrigerator? And they're very good. So I hope you enjoy making those. Of course, if you have help in the kitchen and you want to make real oatmeal raisin cookies and cook them, that's another way to make them too. I like those too. But to get back to what we were talking about right at the beginning, today is National Raisin Day. And we spoke about the fact that California produces most of the world's raisins. So I've added a link at the end for a commercial that used to be on TV that had that featured the California uh, raisins. So if you like to listen to commercials, they're really funny. They have little claymation raisins and they dance around singing songs. So you can see that. And then not to forget your journal prompt for today. Uh, your journal prompt for today is what else can you make using raisins? Okay, that leaves a lot of things open. So maybe when we get back to WOW, you guys can come with back with some suggestions of other things that we can make. But for now, I hope you enjoy your no-bake oatmeal raisin cookies on National Cookie Day and National, no, National Raisin Day and National Oatmeal Cookie Day. Okay, see you next time. Hi guys, Susie here with my trusty assistant, Harris. Hello. Today on our CBE lesson, we are going to be making a bee garden. I've bought lots of plants that I hope to plant uh, in order to make a butterfly and bee sanctuary. But this little tiny part of our garden is going to be dedicated to bees. And that is today's topic of the day. Uh, this uh, instructional sheet will be included in your packet so that you can also make a bee garden in your own home with things that you've just got lying around. You could even do it with existing plants that uh, you may have that you can add or you can go to uh, Home Depot or Lowe's when this is all over or even a garden center and get a little plant. But it is not a necessary part of your little bee garden. It's just something to add a little bit of extra enticement. If you already have some plants that have flowers on them, you can place the little bee garden in the center of that, and it hopefully will attract bees. It will help to give them water, and it'll help um, give them a little place to perch and have a little rest before they go off on their way. Today, we're gonna be learning about why bees are so important to our environment. So I hope you come along with us so that we can all learn about bees together. Bees have a bad reputation, but they're actually pretty awesome creatures who are just misunderstood. Yes, we're all afraid of being stung, but the chances of that happening are actually quite low. Bees are crucial to the ecosystem, and life as we know it would be drastically different without them. So in this video, we're going to take a look at how our lives would change if all the bees in the world disappeared. So what are bees? Bees are a type of flying insect and are a part of the same family that includes wasps and ants. There are actually more than 20,000 different species of bees, from the most common European honeybee to the furry bumblebees. According to fossil records, bees date back to around 100 million years ago, and since then have been an integral part of the development of the Earth's ecosystems. So why are bees important? Bees are an incredibly important factor in the reproduction cycle of flowers. They live in large colonies and feed on the nectar and pollen of plants. The nectar provides them with the energy they need to fly around, and pollen provides them with protein and other nutrients that they need to survive. Bees see different wavelengths of light than we do, so flowers act like colorful beacons to them. They fly in and collect as much pollen and nectar as they can before moving to another plant. Back at the hive, the unique structures and specialized bee within transform what is collected into honey, beeswax, royal jelly, and propolis. These products have been farmed by humans since at least the times of the ancient Egyptians and Greeks due to their unique properties. 
During the collection of these substances, pollen also gets stuck on their bodies. So by flying from plant to plant, bees pollinate flowers as they go. They are regarded as critical pollinators and are responsible for the pollination of 70 out of the top 100 crop species of the world that feed around 90% of the human population. In Europe alone, more than 4,000 different vegetables rely on pollinators to fertilize them. Beyond those crops, they also pollinate countless other species of plants, which form the basis of every food chain. These plants are eaten by smaller animals that are then eaten by larger animals, and therefore the entire ecosystem relies on them. But if bees were no longer around to fulfill this role, then there would be catastrophic consequences. It would mean the loss of 70% of the most important crops in the world for human consumption, and a large number of food chains would be broken. Supermarkets would only have half as many fruit and vegetables as they offer today. There would also be major shortages of dairy because dairy cows, sheep, and goats all rely on bee-pollinated food. It would become far more difficult to rear animals for meat, so food prices would skyrocket. Diets would be restricted to crops and animals that didn't rely on bee pollination, things such as pork, chicken, rice, and corn. Within a relatively short period of time, malnutrition could become a major problem for most of the world's population. Cotton would also cease to grow, which would force us to find alternative materials for clothing and likely make fabrics far more expensive. All of these effects would send a sharp shock to the world economies, with people scrambling for the resources to retain the lifestyles that they have become accustomed to. Although bees aren't going to disappear overnight, there is a serious concern about their falling numbers around the world. In the US, for example, there has been a 40% loss of commercial honeybees since 2006, and similar figures have been reported everywhere else. It's thought that this is happening due to a number of factors that are changing the environment. The greatest concern is industrial agriculture, which uses large amounts of pesticides targeted at other insects but also kills bees. The destruction of natural habitats to clear areas for farmland, as well as the change in global temperatures and weather patterns due to global warming, are also thought to be major contributors. But even though bee populations are already collapsing, it's not too late to do something about it. Ecological farming, which protects the environment by not using chemicals and encouraging biodiversity, is a great start, and wider protection of wild habitats would further support the growth of different species. Limiting the effects of global warming is also crucial because bee colonies require stable weather patterns to survive. But if all else fails and the bees do disappear, there's one option that remains, humans performing the pollination tasks themselves. However, this would require a great deal of manpower and would likely make food far more expensive than it is today. So in conclusion, bees are vitally important to the pollination of plant life around the world, and it would be catastrophic if they were to disappear. Food supplies would dwindle, whole ecosystems would die out, and even fabrics would become harder to produce. It's crucial that more steps are taken to prevent this from happening. And since there's already a good understanding of why it's taking place, measures shouldn't be too difficult to implement as long as everyone's on board with solving the problem. Thanks for watching! If you enjoyed this video, let us know by giving it a thumbs up. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell icon so you don't miss our newest episodes. See you next time! Okay, so the very first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to read some of these directions and I'm going to show you what I have gotten um, that I, I got from my house. You can use a shallow plate that maybe your family doesn't use anymore. It doesn't need to be terribly deep. The one that I got, the bowl that I'm going to be using for this project is this one. Just because it's an old bowl that I don't use anymore. And um, I have dogs, so my plan is later on to kind of put a bunch of rocks together, put it, you know, cement it to the top of the, of the rocks and make sure that it's fixed in place. But for right now, from, from where I'm going to place it right now, that will be sufficient. So the first thing that you need to do is you need to uh, look at the plants in your garden that attract bees. Um, if you're going to add a plant to your um, bowl, make sure that it is a plant that attracts bees. Uh, I'm going to be including um, this list comes with the, with the um, assignment. And so some plants in the spring that attract bees are blueberries, columbine, crabapple, crocus, foxglove, and heather, primrose, wild lupine, and willow. Um, I do have some um, heather here. I have a variety of heather called Mexican heather. 
which is actually not a true heather, but it is a flower of a bee attracting flower. Bees are attracted to many, many types of flowers, and the more colorful, the better. Yep. In the summer, blackberry, catnip, chives, dahlia, raspberry, lavender, which I have uh, there to plant, sunflower, and wild bergamot. In the fall, aster, blue, lobelia, coneflower, cornflower, cosmos, goldenrod, pumpkin, sedum, and squash all attract bees. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. <laughs> Holy <in> dear. <laughs> yes. So the very, very first thing that I'm going to do is we're going to grab some rocks. I got these from my garden. They're rocks that I have at different portions of my garden. And this one, which I just found. I'm also going to include some of these glass, bits of glass. This is um, smooth glass, so it won't hurt them, but it might glint in the water and it might attract the bees. So the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my bowl and we, Harris and I, are going to start placing our rocks around the bottom of the bowl. You can do three or four at a time. You don't have to be super neat with this part. And the reason for the rocks is you want the bees to have a little spot that they can stand on while they drink their water. So we're going to spread the rocks out. May I recommend some? Yes. Uh, to put the little glass on top. No, because we don't want it to be so bright that it puts the bees off. Mm -hmm. We're going to put the glass scattered throughout. I Very good, correct. We just want the glass to peek through. You don't want it to be the main thing because you want the bees to have a chance to be attracted to your to your bowl. And since we are going to be putting some, um, you can see what we've done, since we are going to be putting some, um, a little container with some flowers on the end of it, I'm going to push my rocks towards an edge, like so, so that I can rest my little floral pots on there. And you can always uh, add to that arrangement as, as you build. So I've got these little flowers. Do you see them? <clears throat> these are a flat type of flower called a succulent. And um, it's, it's a type of plant called the succulent. And you, there's, you can tell that they're succulents because succulents have really um, thick leaves that are kind of fleshy. And succulents are very popular right now. I'm not gonna plant all of these on there. I'm just gonna take a few. And I'm going to use some regular Tupperware that I've drilled holes into the bottom of to put my succulents in. And then those are going to rest on the rocks up here. So when I fill it with water, I'm going to make sure that I'm not accidentally filling it with water so much that my succulents are underwater because then they'll die. Okay, so now I have my little pot and Harris has his little pot. And I'm going to take a spoon because they're so teeny that I'm going to use a spoon instead of one of these. And I've, I have some potting soil that I bought. So I'm going to lay a little bit of that soil at the bottom. And Harris is going to lay. And we're going to break it up so that the roots have a nice chance at. If you could hold that up, Harry, so they can see what you're doing. Very good. We're going to break it up and make it nice and soft. So you see it's got, I, I drilled some drainage holes into it so that my little plant doesn't drown. We don't want that to happen. No, we don't. You know, I'm going to take my very first succulent, which I pulled out, and I'm going to hand it to Harris. Thank you. You're welcome. And then I'm going to take my next little succulent. It's hard to get them out because I don't want them to break, but I want to make sure that I get it out of the little box, the little container that it came in. All right, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. 
and there it is. And as you can see, it's got quite a deep root system. Yeah. Harris's didn't have quite so many roots as this one does. So we're going to kind of break that up a little bit so that the roots lay nicely. Don't worry too much about breaking up the roots because roots do tend to grow back. Loosen those up. I'm going to place mine. It's a lovely bit of gardening. Yeah, it's it's nice. It's easy to do. Relaxing. So now my little plant is in its little container, and we're gonna fill in the gaps with some more soil. So I'm gonna put some soil here. It doesn't matter. This is a messy activity, guys. You're gonna get dirty when you're gardening. Don't worry too much about getting dirty. You can always wash it off. Exactly. So you want to make sure that it's not too packed because you want to give it a chance to learn to grow in its new home. Mm -hmm. And also uh, room for the roots to spread out. So yeah, exactly. you, you shouldn't really pack it in there really hard. You should just like lightly pack it. Exactly. So now I've got my bowl here. With my rocks, remember I told you I was going to push them back a little bit, make sure that these are resting well. And I'm going to place mine right here. And I'm still just filling in because mine's a bit small, you know. Mm -hmm. But hey, that's all. That's all right. You know, you have to just let it adapt to the area. Okay, I'm going to have Paris here. You don't want to build it up too far up above the plant. That will get confused, and I'm going to lay his right next to mine. And hopefully soon, I see a few little buds, and hopefully soon these will flower. This is already started flowering. It has. And there you go. There's our two little plants side by side. Now, as these grow, they will spill over, and it'll be a very pretty little bowl as well. Yeah. So now we have our little bowl all set up, and I have here a pitch of water, pitcher of water, which Harris is going to show you. And we're going to fill our little garden, our little bee garden up with some water so that the bees have something nice to drink. When you're putting the water, don't cover the rocks all the way. Leave some room for the bees to stand on, and then um, only fill it as much as you need to, so that they have to get a little bit of water in between the rocks, okay? All right, Harris, so you may pour the water in. I'll tell you when to stop. Keep going, keep going, keep going, stop. So I don't know if you guys can see, but I put just enough water for the bees to have a place to stand when they're eating. I'll include some pictures so you guys can see what it looks like from the top because I know it's hard to see from the camera angle. And also please remember, do not submerge the roots of your little plants. They should be sitting on top of rocks at a safe distance from the water and there should be just enough rocks peeking out that the bees will um, be able to put their little stingers or noses into the water and drink some up. And that's it, that's our activity for today. I hope that you guys get to do one. If you do, as always, please send me a picture or share it with us during a Zoom meeting so that I can see um, what your little bee garden looks like. I hope you enjoyed this activity and I hope that uh, you guys learned a lot about bees and why bees are so important to our environment and how they're important in helping plants grow. Have a good one. Bye. Today, it's all about bees. Everyone loves bees, right? Well, not everyone, but most.
And there's something comforting about seeing a bee buzz from flower to flower, a feeling that the universe is ticking away nicely in the background. But it's not all sunshine and lollipops, as you may have heard in the news. Bees are in trouble. Across the United States, honeybees are suffering from a mysterious condition known as colony collapse disorder, in which hives are found abandoned. And beyond the honeybee, evidence indicates declines in wild pollinators across both North America and Europe. The reason? Changes in agriculture. Wildflower meadows have been ploughed up. Hedges have been ripped out to form bigger fields. Pesticide use has massively increased, and humans have been trading bees around the world in tiny little boxes, causing the spread of disease. But why care? So, here, in no particular order, are my top five reasons why bees are important. One, food. It's not all about honey. Bees, both the wild ones and the ones we keep in hives, are critical for pollinating plants that produce a huge range of food, including blueberries, almonds, and beans. The global value of insect pollination is estimated at 153 billion euros every year. And while this figure includes contributions from, say, butterflies and beetles, most of the work is done by the bees. Still don't care? Commercially reared bumblebees are important pollinators of tomato plants. If the bees die out, these plants will have to be pollinated by hand using little vibrating wands, which is less fun than it sounds, and more expensive. Tomato growing could become unproductive. No tomatoes means no pizza, and a world without pizza is a sad and lonely place indeed. Two, biodiversity. Numerous creatures rely on bees for their own existence. Badgers will dig out the nest to feast on the juicy grubs. Bee eaters consume, well, you can probably guess what they consume, and a whole host of other creatures prey on or parasitize upon the bees, including the endangered oil beetle. Numerous wildflowers depend on bees for pollination. Take away the bees and there will be drastic consequences for both the plants and the animals that depend on them. The world will become a less colourful, less interesting place. Three, bees fight crime. Not a joke. Bees have an excellent sense of smell. And in 2008, scientists developed a detector, essentially a box of bees trained to stick out their tongue if they caught a whiff of something dodgy, like explosives. An infrared sensor registers the movement in the bees' tongues and alerts security staff to the presence of danger. Four, bees are watchdogs for environmental change. Or watch bees, if you're being picky. And speaking of picky, numerous bee species have extremely precise habitat requirements. And if that habitat undergoes a change, their populations will respond quickly. Now this makes bees potentially good indicators of environmental disturbance, including climate change. One recent example, is the arrival of the tree bumblebee in the UK in 2001 from France. The species has now spread to cover over half the country, but fortunately, it's not likely to have any negative impacts on native UK bees. Five, ecosystem services. These are services to which bees contribute that go beyond just pollinating our food plants. Remember the wild plants pollinated by bees? Well, some of them will grow big and strong and soak up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, a process known as carbon sequestration, potentially offsetting human-caused emissions. Their roots might bind the soil together, preventing erosion, and slow the seepage of water through the ground, helping to minimize floods. At present, no one's calculated the value of all these services, currently being provided for free, but as anyone who's ever stared through the window of a super expensive shop will know, just because there's no price tag doesn't mean something isn't extremely valuable. So, bees provide us with food, help maintain biodiversity, fight crime, act as indicators of environmental change, and contribute to a whole load of ecosystem services. So the next time you order pizza, 
or enjoy a blueberry muffin. Spare a thought for the bees. Hi, I'm David. And I'm Phil. And we're conservation biologists and the presenters of a new show called EcoSapien, which explores the importance of the natural world and biodiversity. If you like this episode, or any other, why not hit the subscribe button? We need all the help and support we can get to continue producing the huge array of videos we hope to make. Thanks for watching. Hey guys, I'm back inside my house because it was so hot out there today. So I do think that uh, gardening is something that you should do maybe early in the morning or once the sun has set and it's not quite so hot. As you guys know here in South Florida, it gets hot pretty quickly. So I'm going to uh, follow this portion of the video with some um, pictures of how my little bee garden turned out. I'm really excited to see if the bees use it. I also wanted to give you an update on my feeders. So um, after a few days of watching um, different uh, animals come and eat off the feeders that we made, um, my husband and I decided that we were gonna make more permanent feeders. So he got to work, he got his drill out, he got, um, he got his uh, saw out, and he made some pretty cool perches and a cute little um, bird feeder box. I'm also going to include some pictures of that with some of the little animals that have been enjoying the bird seed that we put out. So far, we've had four squirrels who come every single day and we look forward to seeing them and enjoy watching them eat their food. And we've also had a lot of blue jays and a species of bird called a corvid. Uh, we still haven't been able to identify what exactly that bird is. It's a beautiful bird with different tones of browns and blacks. Um, but so far they seem to be enjoying and now I'm getting excited thinking that maybe I even want to put in a hummingbird feeder. Um, maybe that's something that we can do in another lesson coming up. So I'm going to include all of those pictures now at the end of our, of our video so that you guys can enjoy and you can catch up with what's happening in my garden. Until next time. Hi everyone, Susie here. Today I'm going to be reviewing your special topics. Uh, special topics we are on are week one special topics and that covers your support planning participation, your uh, services satisfaction, as well as your choices. Do I participate in the support planning IPP meeting? You're meant to. You are the reason everyone that is gathered at that IPP meeting is there. So take that opportunity to use your voice and to discuss with us what your personal goals are, what your intention for the following year are, um, and if there is anything that you are extra satisfied with, we love to hear that. And we also like to hear uh, what you want us to help you with. Maybe there are things you're not satisfied with. And that's a good time to speak up. Do I choose my services? Yes. Um, your services are up to you. It is your needs that uh, we try to meet with the services that we put in place for you. So if there is anything, any particular need that you have that you feel is not being met, please let someone on the WOW staff know um, so your social services team works really hard to make sure that uh, your choices are listened to and that we pay attention to those choices, um, not just at WOW, but with your other services as well. Am I happy with all my services? I hope so. I hope that you're happy with the services that you're getting. However, if you are not happy with any services, Please do not hesitate to speak up. Sometimes you might think, 
<clears throat> should I speak up about this? Should I bring it up? Should I not? We are all here to help you. So please, by all means, use your big voice and speak up so that we know for sure that the services that you're getting are the services that you need. And if you have a need that you feel isn't being met, or maybe it's a need that we don't know about yet, maybe it's just something that you're thinking in your own head, something that you need, this is the time for you to speak up and to, um, to vocalize that need to us. Because if we don't know you have a need, then we can't help you have that need fulfilled, right? So please let us know. Do I choose my goal? Yes, your goal is ultimately your choice. As your instructors, we sit with you and we try to assess where you need to work on something so that we can choose a goal that is beneficial to you. Um, we don't just choose the goals willy-nilly. Um, oftentimes, the goals are tailored to what your particular needs are. But at the end of the day, the choice of that goal is up to you. Am I happy with the goal that I chose? <clears throat> I hope you are. I love seeing how excited you get when you have a new goal that you're working on. And I know that at first, sometimes working on a new goal is difficult because you don't know it yet. You're not familiar with it. But one of the things that I love as your instructor, and I know that all of us instructors love, is to watch you transition from somebody who's unsure about their goal and learning a new goal and working on a new goal to someone who is confident in that goal. And towards the end, usually about three to four weeks in, we start to see that confidence starting to pick up and we start to see you become very proud of yourself when you accomplish your goal. That's why for us, it's so important <clears throat> that we continue to monitor your goal, especially now that we are having virtual classes instead of seeing you every day. It's important for us to call you up and to check, are you doing, how are you doing on that goal? Are you, are you comfortable with it yet? Are you succeeding at that goal? Um, I know that one of my favorite parts of my day is getting to talk to all of you on the phone. And I know that that's true for your other instructors as well. Do I make choices on the activities at the WOW Center? <clears throat> the whole structure of the WOW Center circles around your choices. Your choices are important to us because they are the cornerstone, the important stone, right? Because the whole WOW Center is built around that. It's built around your choices. So we work very hard as instructors to make sure that your voices are heard and that when we're planning our calendar for the following month, that we are taking into account those choices. That's why, for instance, um, I've covered life and work skills when we're making choices in that class. And um, I love your participation in that. I love when you raise your hand and you, want, you say, I want to work on a new healthy snack that I can uh, learn how to make here at the WOW Center, and then I can take home and teach others how to make. Um, in our program, the CBE program, um, we love finding new and exciting places in the community to go out. And that's why um, we always ask you, have you been anywhere that you'd like to visit with CBE? Um, daily in CBE, you choose where to eat, but once a month, you choose what you want to do in the community. So we're always on the lookout for new and exciting adventures for us to have together and for places that offer us an opportunity to learn and to grow and to integrate with the community in that special way that only we can do. I know all of your teachers are very uh, proud of the choices that you are presented with. And I know that we all like to hear uh, when you have new and exciting choices that we could all participate in together. Am I happy with my service providers? The WOW Center is one of your service providers. Group homes or other service providers 
Other programs, like the weekend programs that some of you attend on Saturday and Sunday, are also service providers. So if you are happy with those service providers, it's important for us to know because then it might be a service that we can offer somebody else, um, that we can tell somebody else about. Maybe there's somebody who is not in a Saturday or Sunday program. Maybe there's somebody that's not participating in Coach Gloria's program, for instance, or Special Olympics program. Um, so it's important for us to know when you're happy with those services because then we think, oh, that's a good service to offer others. But as well as that, it's important for us to know if you feel that you're not happy with a program uh, or with a service um, so that we can then find out why, what's going on that you're not happy with it. Maybe it's not something you're very keen on or excited about doing, but maybe it's something that you um, that you need in your life, you know? Um, like maybe, maybe you don't love exercise, but exercising is a healthy component to having a healthy life. And we know, um, as um, we've told you before, that healthy body also ties to a healthy mind, right? Am I happy with my support coordinator? Your support coordinator is your biggest advocate. An advocate is somebody who uses their voice to speak up for you, right? To help you achieve your goals. So I hope that you're happy with your support coordinator. I know that we at the WOW Center work with many wonderful support coordinators. Um, so it's really important for you to establish a good relationship with yours. Um, it's important that you are able to uh, feel comfortable in voicing your desires to your support coordinator and in voicing um, your goals to your support coordinator. Um, so please treat your support coordinator as one of your best friends because they really are. They're really out there. Their only job is to make sure that you are getting the services that you require and want. Do I know and understand that I can make changes if I am unhappy with my services, service providers, and support coordinator? As I said, all of our services are tailored to you. Um, so it is very important to make sure that you understand that you can make changes with your service providers, with your services that you're receiving, as well as with your support coordinator. On the very rare occasion that you're not happy with any of those things, it's important for you to know that you can use your voice, that you can tell our social services staff, that you can tell an instructor, um, I'm not happy with this service, or I'm not happy with um, my, this service provider, or I'm not happy with my support coordinator, so that we can make sure that we um, find a way for you to be happy in all of those things because your happiness is very important to all of us. Do I know the number if I am dissatisfied with my services? The agency consumer complaint number is 1-888-419-3455. Um, if you're not satisfied with any of those services, that's certainly a number that you can use to contact them and let them know that you're not happy. Um, however, more accessible to you and easier for you to, um, to approach are your instructors or the staff at your group home or your family at home. Use that big voice that we always talk about and speak up because if you're not happy, we need to know about it. Again, we can't fix it if we don't know you're not happy, right? So use your big voice. That's what it's there for. Am I respected? At the WOW Center, we work very, very hard to make sure that you know that you are respected. That you know that you are someone worthy and deserving of respect. Not just our respect, but society's respect 
our community's respect. And that's something that we pride ourselves in pushing for. And that's something that we at the WOW Center, all of us, work very hard to achieve. We work very hard to make sure that the community at large is respecting you in the way that you should be respected. If you ever feel that you are not being respected, and again, you need to speak up, use your big voice, let us know how you feel um, that you're not being respected. But I know that all of your, all of my fellow instructors, all of your instructors, all of the staff that surrounds you uh, is put there in order to ensure that you are respected. So let us know, let's hear from you. My daily life and work. Can I choose my day activities? Yes, of course. Life is full of choices. From the moment that we wake up, we choose what we're going to do with our day. How are we going to spend our day? Am I going to wash my face first or brush my teeth first? It can come down to those little choices, right? Um, <clears throat> of course, you're able to choose your uh, daily activities. For all of us, there are choices in our day. There are things that we need to do daily. Um, for instance, we need to focus on our hygiene daily. Um, we need to maybe go to work daily. Maybe we need to go to the WOW Center daily when the WOW Center is operational. Maybe we need to sit down in front of a computer and, and have our virtual classes daily. But these are all things that are designed to help you. So. Yes, you can choose your daily activities. Make sure that you're making wise choices, that you're putting your time into the things that are going to develop you physically, mentally, and spiritually as well. Am I happy with the WOW Center? I hope that you are. I know that all of my fellow instructors and all of the staff at the WOW Center hopes that you are because your happiness at the WOW Center is our goal. Our personal daily goal is to make sure that you are happy there. So again, it's important to use your big voice. If you know you could be happier if something was going on, then let us know about it and maybe we can make that happy, happen, right? So that we can ensure that you continue to be happy. We're always looking for ways to improve and we're always looking for ways to make sure that you are happy in your day-to-day -day life. Do I want to do the activities that I do during the day? That's an important question. Again, look at where you're putting your time in your day-to-day -day activity. Make it intentional. Make sure that what that that you are doing things that really do satisfy you, that really are helping you grow, that really are bringing you maximum happiness, right? Having said that, there are things we, activities we all have to do day to day that maybe sometimes we're not very keen on, you know? Maybe some days you wake up and you're a little tired and you're not sure if you want to go to work or you're not sure if you want to go to the well center. But push yourself through that uh, one, you know, that kind of, mm, I don't know if today, because um, usually what we see is when you guys come in in the morning, sometimes you're a little sluggish and you're tired and you're sleepy and, you know, maybe you haven't had your breakfast yet. Then by the time we all head outside and the music is on, we all become engaged and then we're happy, right? Um, so sometimes it's important to push yourself through that to get to enjoying an activity. But um, I hope that you are generally happy with the activities that you are participating in in your day-to-day -day life. If you find that there's an activity that you're not um, particularly happy in your day-to-day -day life, Speak up, let us know. We don't know if you don't tell us. Do I want a job in the community? One of the things we are very proud of at WOW is that we're able to help individuals find jobs and job opportunities in the community. I know that your supported employment team is constantly looking for places where you can work. 
So if a job is something that you want but don't yet have, you can reach out to Julie or Melissa or Renee or any of your staff members so that we can pass on that information and we can make sure that someone speaks to you about the possibility of having a job in the community. Can I choose to work? Of course you can. You can choose to work if you like. And that's not a decision that we take lightly at the WOW Center. We discuss this um, with many people on the road to trying to find the best fit, the best job for you. So if working is something you want to do, again, use your big voice, let us know. Am I happy with my job? <clears throat> I love nothing more than to see you guys being proud of the work that you do. I love hearing, for instance, from Eric, how happy he is at the Gap, or um, I love hearing from Roy, how happy he is at uh, Publix, or Rudy, or I love hearing from uh, Jerome, how happy he is at Baptist Hospital, and um, Anna Maria. So if you're happy with your job, let me know, because I really get a kick out of hearing what you do and what makes you proud of yourself. Um, so if you're happy with your job, that's a good question to ask yourself because sometimes we all need a little bit of a reminder. Man, I really am happy with my job, right? My home. Do I choose where I want to live? Yes, the choice of where you want to live is ultimately yours. Again, it's a choice that shouldn't be taken lightly. It's a choice that should be discussed amongst families with uh, social services, but these are choices that you do have. Um, as I said, though, it's a choice that shouldn't be taken lightly, and it's something that requires the discussion and involvement of a team of people to help you find the place where you will be happiest. Am I happy where I live? You know, um, right now, especially that we're all having to stay in our homes because we are in a time of quarantine and social distancing, um, it's important to take responsibility for our own happiness, right? So um, I hope that you're happy where you live. Um, and I know that, you know, sometimes things happen wherever we live, but we can all work towards, make ourselves, towards making ourselves happier in every respect of our lives. For instance, I know in my own home, there's been, I've had a to-do list for a long time. So now that I've got a lot of time at home, I'm putting some of my energy into making those changes so that I can be even happier where I live, right? Even if you are happy, there's always room for improvement. So don't just sit back you know, we might as well put the work in to, to improve our own situation and our own surroundings, right? Maybe you want to make a, a decorative change to your room. Who knows? But work towards making yourself happy. Um, your happiness is your responsibility. So put some work into it. Am I happy with the services and supports that I receive at home? Most of us <clears throat> live in homes where um, the people that surround us work really hard to make sure that we are happy, right? So use that to your advantage. Use your big voice. Is there room for improvement? Is there something that I can change so that I can be even happier? You have to voice that, okay? Because Yes, your services and your supports that you're receiving at home um, are overseen by other people, but that's the extent of, of their involvement, right? They're going to work to make you happy. So use your big voice. Let us know. Let us know what makes you happy so we could do more of it. Let us know what doesn't make you happy so we could do less of it. But the important thread through all of these week one special topics is you and your voice. So speak up, use that voice, and let us know what you want.
Hope you all have a wonderful week. Make sure lots of hand washing, lots of sanitizing, and maintain that social distancing so that we could all stay healthy and we can all see each other again very, very soon. Bye.